Yes. I saw. Let's just honor this moment. I <laughs> saw Stacey is the best issue. with Stacy is. Let's remember that Stacy is the best with tech. <laughs> no, don't remember that. Don't don't remember that. This is such a rare. <laughs> Okay, now we're Hi, going. Jessica. Hi, Jessica. I'm going to see if I can make these speakers work. So I will be right back. Yep. How are you two today? Hey, I'm doing very well, Jessica. And you? I'm okay. I'm really hoping that my signal is good today. I have a new computer now that I left my lab. And so I've been noticing on some Zoom calls, I keep freezing up. So Do, if I yeah. freeze, just let me know, send me a, a a DM or something and just say, hey, you're freezing and maybe I can turn off my video or something. Um, yep. How's it coming through now? It's perfect. No, yeah. no problems at all. No problems at all. So, I mean, good rule of thumb, if you haven't already done it, is turn everything off that you don't need. Like turn off your Outlook, turn off anything. Yeah, I was noticing I had, because um, at some point I was using my iPhone hotspot, like when I'm around and I can't connect and I feel like it was unsure which one to ping. And so I'm not sure mm -hmm. if it was always like in this like in-between connectivity right. space. Yep. So I turned that yep. off and hoping that fixed it. Yeah, well, just because I was having so much problem, so many problems last week, I'm, I moved to the office today just because yeah. I just can't. Yeah. I do not want the stress of fighting it. Um, Stacey, I had a few logistical questions around the first mural activity we're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so we initially want people to do this exercise with the decision making um, and then moving on to kind of letting Bennett talk about what's going on with the state agency reps. Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, and I'm just trying to figure out how to introduce all of that, <laughs> like trying to say we're going to do both of these things. First, we're going to do the decision making and then take a pause and then introduce the the Bennett section or like doing all of that at the onset and then yep. just letting them do you, both. <laughs> you want me to do that part? Not the, not the introducing Bennett part, but you want me to take care of the, hey, we would like to have you weigh in on the types of tools we'll lean into. I'm happy to do that. Well, I have a little script for it. I'm fine with it. It's just sort of trying to figure out the sequence of introducing that part and then also okay. the part with Bennett. Um, yeah. And I wasn't sure well, what your question was around like having that be a thing and then we take a step back and then talk about. Well, why don't you run through it? I mean, talk us through it. Go ahead and use your script and see, let's, let's see how it feels. I do this all the time. Right. Yeah. So I don't get self-conscious right now. We're just trying to figure out if if it's landing with clear direction. So go ahead. All right. So what I have right now. So we're going to do a few things on mural. The first is to go over our decision making tools that we originally discussed at our first meeting. And the second is to take an opportunity to make sure the state agency reps on the task force are feeling heard in this process. So we can get some feedback um, on, on what we need. That's not the exact thing. But um, mm -hmm. so for. So then I would go, okay, so for the decision-making tools, we put some stuff in the mural, and then I might direct it to you, Stacey, to say kind of what that prompt is. And then mm -hmm. we'll give people like, I don't know, five five minutes for that. And then I can be like, okay, now we want to talk about getting more feedback from the state reps. Perfect. Perfect. And if that works. I'll, I'll round things out uh, okay. when, you, when you pitch it over to me. That's just fine. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh-huh. We're all good on my end now. Excellent. Something happened and YouTube saved all my changes from last time. So I didn't have to even like go in and turn off the comments in the chat or anything. Oh. This is like the greatest day. <laughs> <laughs> and it's sad that I think it's the greatest day because of that. <laughs> no, did it really? Jeez. Oh, <clears throat> it's like uh, when we set up Padlets and they have those cutesy little lines for the subtitle. Uh-huh. Um, all hearts and flowers here. Well, no, <laughs> no, not really. Can I change that? I'd like to yeah. change that. <laughs> okay. Everything in mural should be locked down now, except obviously the stickies and things like that. And I I um, um am just wanting to make sure just that you're fine with the um outline 
buttons. I've, I've not gone in there knowing that you were going to go in there and, and line things up. Are you okay? Yeah. Okay. I got easy it all. Easy peasy, isn't it? Yep. Yeah, it is. Yep. Got it all set yep. up on. Uh, oh, except that. Uh, and remember, I I just this morning changed the outline slide to um, just dragging down the original flowchart that Nick that, did. So that was the what I was gonna just there change. you go. Yep. Never mind. Okie dokie. Thank you. Uh -huh. And in that case, you just highlight a section. You just drag across the whole thing, and right click. Oh, okay. Okay, since there is no actual slide there. Right. Did you send the Zoom link invitation to the two Lycos people? I'm not seeing them on the calendar list. Uh, yeah, they should be. They like, should be on talking. the meeting invite, and they should have been on the... I see Chris Stolke still on here. I see Buck Humphrey on here, but I, I don't... Can't, I can't get rid of, like, the old, the people who are no longer, like, with the state. It's highly annoying. I'm not seeing it. Let's see. Well, if you see them, that's on, I don't. I don't yeah. see them on my calendar invite. Uh, They're on mine because I did forward it to them. And Jessica, mm -hmm. I just want to. I'm just noticing that the lead presenter, the far right column for the first opening stuff, was referring to our Jess, probably leftovers from last month. I'm just flipping that back to me. Okay. okay. Oh, sorry. I thought I changed, took my name off of that. No, that would have been my mistake. I should have caught it. Are you looking at the mural or the run a show? Run a show. And Jessica, the Senator Coleman announcement is on your radar. Yeah. You want me to say that? Yeah. If you want to call forward the roll call uh, yeah. and then just announce it, then you can uh, turn it over to me and I'll start calling names. I've got Coleman crossed out on my roll call list, and I've got an A for Stefan. Thank you for forwarding that to me. Yep. And as of uh, Stacy and I were just talking, uh, I asked uh, the legislative assistant who sent the email about Senator Coleman if there was a plan with Senator Senate leadership to replace her. Um, haven't heard back. We haven't heard anything from Kari about. Um, whether they've gotten anywhere either with the Senate. And I'm going to interrupt here and just welcome some of the members that are starting to appear. We'll begin soon, so I would imagine we'll start seeing uh, rapid fire uh, joining uh, on this meeting. Uh, but good to see those of you that are popping on right now, so hang tight. Hey, Adam. Hi, Paula. Ranji. Ari. Any of you need to check your microphones, feel free to come on board and just give yourself a sound check. That's just fine. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. I hear you just All right. Perfectly. See, Renji's on his, uh, what is that? It's like a walking desk. It's like a treadmill, treadmill desk. Yeah. <laughs> Do you so like that, Renji? Bald, please call 911. I'm <laughs> actually in the hospital, so I'll be okay. <laughs> it hasn't happened yet, but you never know. <laughs> Do you like that walk-in desk thing? Yeah, I love it. I love it. I don't like sitting. I don't like sitting yeah. for periods of time. So it's good for my back. For my back. Yeah. Ron, Ronji, this is Stacy. I used to have one uh, several years ago, and the I, and it was great for doing what we're doing right now. But I've noticed at the time that there was one thing that I can't do when I'm walking on a treadmill desk, and that is get into my creative space, I've got to be perfectly still yeah. to figure out a creative solution for something. Once I've got it, I'm fine. So I always have a good time talking with others that are using treadmill desks to say, like, when doesn't it work for you? What, yeah, what's no, I get it. I'm kind of the same way. I, it's Creativity takes a little bit more. It's, it's a different beast, but yeah. I'm doing something where I'm just taking it and listening in. I'll stop, too, if I need to, like, have to think about things. But yeah, yeah. I do. Yeah. Yeah. Welcome. I see more people joining us. It's 931. Jessica, I'll look to you for a sign to go ahead and start as chair. So let me know when you're feeling like we've got the critical mass. Yeah, just counting. I don't know that we're at quorum just yet. One sec. Okay. 
let's give it a bit more time. That gives members a chance to get into their murals. You'll recall we always include the link for the mural and the password in your um, invitation. Uh, just sent it out. Uh, just was it Friday afternoon? I think that was the reminder email. Yes. Reminder email. Yep. Yep. So I see more people pop. It is a there. meeting invite though too. Yeah. Or it should be. Now I'm wondering if it is or not. Looks like we have a quorum now. All right. Well, officially then. Welcome. Hi everyone. I missed you last month, May 6. You might recall was my birthday, so I was out climbing a, a Minnesota mountain up north and had a moment where I was climbing up, thought, oh, I wonder how that meeting's going. And then I kept climbing. So uh, it's good to be back with all of you. Um, I've got some um, just standard updates for members and then standard updates and, and information for those of you that might be observing. I'll go through those quickly right now with uh, uh, Jess's help with uh, her shared screen. Uh, to our task force members, always helps. Uh, particularly, when we, particularly when we're discussing things for you to keep your cameras on if you have the bandwidth and if that works for you. So thank you for doing that if it works. Um, we try to use our hand raise feature so we don't have verbal traffic jams. Uh, the chat feature is turned off. Uh, we keep that off for reasons of uh, public transparency because we are streaming this to YouTube. Uh, and then as I mentioned before, if you haven't members, go ahead and get yourself on mural. Remember, don't uh, just join as a visitor, don't join as a member or all sorts of weird things will happen. Um, to uh, observers, uh, welcome. We're so glad you're here and interested in the work of this task force. Um, we've got, um, oh, and I'm just, I'm just looking at what what's on the slides there. Uh, a reminder to all of you that the meeting isn't recorded. Uh, it's live streamed and we will have information about the meeting uh, posted on the website uh, for this task force and MDH's website. Uh, so uh, we'll get that up. I think it's usually within 10 business days, but sometimes I see it sooner than that. Um, and Jess, if you can go to the next slide, please. Um, a reminder for and we don't have any slides being shown right now, FYI. Well, that's interesting. I'm seeing Jess's slides. Is, is there anybody else that is not seeing slides from members? If you could just uh, use your raised hand feature. Let's see if it's something with Jessica's screen or something else. They are showing mm -hmm. up on the YouTube stream. The slides. So are. Jessica, maybe your new computer. So hang in there. I'll keep going gives you a chance to do a little troubleshooting. Uh, and by keep going, I want to remind everybody about the legislative charge. The Psychedelic Medicine Task Force was established to advise the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. For purposes of this work, psychedelic medicine means MDMA, psilocybin, and LSD. And to the next slide, because I think there's a little bit more. Uh, the next two slides, actually, don't go to the next one yet, uh, really talk and unpack the, the specific duties of the task force uh, in terms of scientific research. And I'm just slow walking that, and Jess is slow walking it too, so you can absorb that information. And then just if you'll move to the next slide, there we go. A bit more of the duties here, all outlined in the statute. So we'll walk everybody through that information as we need to, uh, but it's there for your um, for for your information. Um, all right. So if we could, I just did I miss the one about who all are we? The leadership team did i just zoom right past there we go okay thank you uh just in case you're curious about who's participating here in in various leadership roles uh mdmh or md <laughs> mdh's staff is kari globin uh who is the epidemiologist supervisor injury and violence prevention section 
And then Dr. Caroline Johnson, who is our uh, researcher extraordinaire. You'll hear a bit more from her in a while. Um, the task force leadership itself uh, includes Dr. Jessica Nielsen, um, Bennett Hart, and uh, Paula DeSanto. And then you've been listening to me talking. My name is Stacy Shogren. I am a senior consultant with MAD, and I'm joined with uh, joined by uh, Jess Burke uh, and Nick Kaur. And I'm squinting because on my screen, those slides are all really, really small, but you'll all be great. We're glad to be here helping you out this morning. Um, and with that, then, I want to check in with Jess and see if your computer stuff is tracking now or um, where you're at. Jessica, I'm sorry, Jessica. Me, yeah, I got it figured out. Thanks. Did you? Oh, good. Okay. All right. So uh, I think, Jessica, we're ready to uh, roll right into some um, housekeeping for the task force. Uh, if you're an observer, we always have some basic business we have to, to get through. So I'm going to turn it over to Jessica and turn my attention to getting my um, uh, voting log all set to go. So Jessica. Yeah, thanks so much, Stacey. And thank you, task force members, for joining today and for all the observers that are watching and listening to our proceedings today. Uh, so we're going to take care of some logistical business first. We need to do a roll call of all of our members to make sure that we have a quorum. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to you, Stacey, real quick to do a vote or do a roll call um, of our members. Yep. All right. Here we go. Um, Courtney Amundsen. Here. Helen Best Bassett. Helen, are you here? Helen, 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 Helen. I'm not seeing her on the list. So, okay. And one, one quick thing I forgot to mention we did have hmm. one of our members resign from the task force. Senator Julia Coleman um, is no longer a task force member. So, we currently don't have a uh, Republican senator rep on the task force at this meeting. Uh, and there was some a, outreach. Is that oh, sorry, do we have a Republican going? House rep? I think Nolan West is still on the task force, but okay. we have a replacement for the Senate seat. Yeah. Got and it. we've we have we have reached out to see if they will be pursuing a replacement for Julia. Haven't heard back yet. Okay. Uh where am I? Guthrie, Capicella. Uh good morning. I'm here. Hey, Guthrie. Paula DeSanto? Here. Jeremy Drucker? Here. Uh, Stefan Egan is absent today. Dr. Margaret Gabian? Yes, here. Hi, Margaret. Bennett Hartz? Here. David Hong? Here. Good morning. Good morning. Nick Leonards? Uh, Nick, 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 are you here? No, I don't think he's here. Sure. Ari McHenry. Here. Hi, Ari. Senator Kelly Morrison. Kelly. Okay. Dr. Jessica Nielsen. Here. Kit O'Neill. Here. Jill Phillips. Here. Hey, Jill. Ken Sass. I'm here. Uh, Representative Andy Smith. Here. Michael Tabor. Good morning, here. Adam Tonsick. Good morning. Hey, Adam. Ranji, how you doing on that treadmill? I'm doing well, haven't fallen yet, I'm here. <laughs> Excellent, that's Dr. Ranji Verghese and Representative Nolan West. Nolan? All righty. Um, did you miss Donovan? Sorry, I signed on late. Donovan sat there. There you go. Thanks, Donovan. All right, back to you, Jessica. All right, thanks, Stacey, and thank you, everyone, for uh, doing the roll call. So next, we're going to um, talk about some co member collected feedback. Um, so 
for those of you that have held listening sessions or pinged uh, the agencies that you worked for, this is the opportunity to share um, anything that you've learned that you want to uh, provide for the task force. So we'll just leave this open for discussion. If folks want to come on camera, either raise your hand um, and we can call on you in order um, to present any feedback you have from your various communities um, at this time. Thank you. Yeah, Margaret. Hi, so um, I've had two listening sessions. Um, these are a little bit ago, but because I had to miss the last meeting. But um, the themes that I heard, which were both from providers who are also patients, um, was really the desire, and none of this will be earth shattering for us or things we've all talked about, but access outside of the medical system, as well as quick and easy access outside of the medical system, really highlighting from a patient perspective, the need for these interventions quickly, because sometimes uh, their life or death on the line in terms of people's struggles um, and how effective that they have been to getting people help quickly and effectively. Um, the other theme that was throughout all the people I talked to was a desire for a public education campaign, as well as some sort of guiding manual type of document that would talk about dosing, safety precautions, contraindications, the standards, how we monitor and keep people safe, um, both for providers, as well as the people that are um, providing this facilitation outside of the medical system. Um, so that, I think that's those are the main themes that everyone was talking about. Thank you so much, Margaret. Yeah. That's really helpful. Yeah. Oh, any any other member feedback? Hello, this is Donovan Sather. I'd just like to speak on our. Oh, sorry, my hand wasn't raised. It's okay, Donovan. You can go first, and then we'll have Renji. Sorry, Renji. Um, so, I've been working on um, on doing outreach in my community and building a foundation of what I'm going to be taking out to the larger community in Ojibwe country here. So I've worked this month on talking with some program providers within our tribe and their uh, concerns and discussions uh, kind of led to, we need to get uh, some public education out there. So we know what we're going to be adding or working towards so people are aware. Um, there's not a lot of knowledge on psychedelics and use um, from what I'm gathering and figuring out a message and keeping it. Uh, I think, you know, the message I'm always sharing is uh, alternatives way of healing through natural plant medicine. So as I keep it in that perspective, um, people are understanding when they hear the spiel and hear the, the options and how we could potentially utilize this medicine for healing. Um, it's just going to take a little bit of developing towards doing the outreach in the next communities, being the other reservations and having a good message and a way to gather feedback, uh, maybe through surveying and, and such. So that's my update for, for this meeting. Miigwech. Thank you, Donovan. Renji? Yeah, thank you. I think uh, there's a theme from what Margaret has been saying and what Donovan was saying was just education. So I've been reaching out to uh, medical health communities, not only with uh, my colleagues in psychiatry, but non-psychiatric colleagues as well. And what I'm largely seeing is there's not a lot of information. There's not a lot of education. So there's a little bit of, I wouldn't say confusion, just um, what my task now is uh, not just to provide a survey, but just to provide a little bit of education on what this is and what we're not necessarily tasked to do, but just the basics on psychedelics. Um, and so when I do that, when I sort of compile some sort of a general uh, education, because that's the feedback that I received, I'm going to resend this survey and then have sort of a more informed consent from, or informed decision by these folks. So to be to be con uh, uh, concluded or whatever. Continued. Thank you, Renji. That's really helpful. Um, Paula. Thank you. Um, just briefly, I've been talking with um, some folks that are um, actively uh, using substances and uh, also experiencing some mental health issues. 
through a, a outreach and trauma support uh, initiative. And um, also getting a lot of calls from family members and loved ones expressing concern about um, the well-being of, of their either themselves or their, or their loved ones. But just uh, uh, there's a sense of desperation that I've, I've not ever experienced in, in my 40 years of practice that uh, that, uh, that it's um, more a crisis, uh, more harsh, more death, more doggy dog, more des more desperation. And uh, there seems to be a general lack of hope. Um, and people are calling and talking about needing uh, something that's going to offer hope. And there's a, a very active interest in uh, the psychedelics as a possible source of you know, hope to help people shift perspectives, um, gain some sense of maybe reset, um, ways to break patterns that seem to be uh, at, the, at this point um, kind of really entrenched and, and difficult to, to recover from. So I don't, I don't know, just there's, there's a level of desperation out there beyond all the grief from all the death. So, yeah. Thank you, Paula. Is there any other updates from members that you wanna share at this time? Guthrie, I know you had mentioned previously you were going to attend the MIAC meeting the, in May. Did that happen or no? Uh, good morning. I reached out to MIAC um, in advance of their meeting, and and they were aware of the of Donovan being on board um, and didn't want any further updates. So they, they didn't feel like it was necessary for us to come at the time. So I didn't go. Okay, thank Thanks. you. That's, Thanks. That's cool. All right. Any other updates from members before we move on? I had a brief listening session. Um, only one or two people showed up and it was more somebody that was getting ready to go to Oregon uh, to try their psilocybin services um, out of curiosity, had not ever done mushrooms before, um, but really wanted to have a very carefully curated experience uh, with a professional. Um, and so it wasn't really much feedback other than, you know, somebody being willing to travel out of state to to find these services because they're not available here. Um, and so that's all I have to update from for now from the community. One more sec for folks, if anyone else has an update. I can give an update. Sorry, my internet's not fantastic. Great, thanks Courtney. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna try and make it fast. Um, a couple of things, are, they're mostly general things that have come up such as affordability regulation for um, how therapies are, or the therapeutic, um, therapeutically provided services, but also that there's some regulation, this is a new one, around non-therapeutic um, access. Um, yeah, that's kind of it. Thank you, Courtney. All right, anyone else have any updates from your, your community? Okay, hearing none. Um, if there's anything pressing, you can go ahead and maybe write that up and send it to the task force, but we'll move on to our agenda. So now we're just, I'm going to just give a brief high level overview of kind of what our agenda is today and the things we want to uh, get through for this June meeting. So we've already, uh, we'll first uh, go and approve our May meeting minutes. Um, and then we will um, do some, we already did the member collected feedback. I'm then going to give a high level overview of kind of our decision flow chart that um, was put together by Nick Kaur around kind of what is our process and timeline for um, all the work that we're doing and where are we at and where do we still need to go. Um, then we'll take a brief 10 minute break and then we're going to hear some updates on uh, the status of MDMA clinical trials. First from our local psychedelic researcher, Dr. Caroline Johnson, who will provide a research summary from MDMA clinical trials. Um, followed by a presentation from uh, two people from Lycos Therapeutics, who are the ones that are um, pushing to get MDMA approved by the FDA for, MD, uh, for PTSD. And so they will be presenting on the status of that as the FDA is currently reviewing that for potential approval in August. Then we'll take another brief 10 minute break and then we'll close out the meeting with some working group updates and some mural activities to discuss where we're at with some of these recommendations that we're thinking of. Um, moving forward. So next we need to actually um, approve our meeting minutes. So we're going to do a vote by roll call. Um, do I have a motion um, to uh, approve the meeting minutes? So moved. All right. Do we have a second? I'll second. second. We had Adam motion and Bennett uh, second. 
Right. So we'll do a vote by roll call. Assuming, is there anybody that wants to talk about any of the meeting minutes, anything that you felt was inaccurate or needs to be updated um, or added to the meeting minutes before we move to uh, vote to approve the minutes from May? All okay, right. hearing, assuming everyone's read the meeting minutes, let's move to a vote by roll call. Yep. And I just need, I was getting my screen situated. Who is the second, please, Jess, Jessica? Bennett. Thanks. All right, I'm going to go with first names and we're going to run right through this. Courtney. Yes. Helen. Oh, Helen's absent. Uh, Guthrie. Uh, I'm standing due to absence. Paula. Approve. Jeremy. Yes. Margaret. Abstain. Absent. Bennett. Approve. David. David. David, your microphone is off. Are you there? All right. Um, Ari. Approve. Jessica. Approve. Kit. Approve. Jill. Approve. Ken. Approve. Donovan. Approve. Andy. I approve. Michael. Approve. Adam. Approved. Ranji. Approved. And then I want to just go back up and say, David, are you back at your desk? Yes. Ah, My vote is approved. Thank you so much. I knew you'd be around. All right. There we go. So minutes have been approved. Good to go. Great. Thank you so much, everyone, for voting and participating. Um, so do we want to move on to the next slide? Because now we're going to get into, uh, we already talked about the desired meeting outcomes. Uh, so we can move on to the next slide. OK. So I want to take this opportunity to give a, a high level summary of what we've learned so far and what we still need to do with the task force. Um, so this is just a kind of brief overview of our work cadence. I'll go into this in a little bit, but just to remind folks that up until this month in June, we've been doing a lot of learning and pinging subject matter experts and trying to understand what the meat of this work really is. So we have all that information together to help us make decisions on what our recommendations will be. All right, next slide, please. So this is a really busy uh, timeline decision flow chart that Nick Core put together. This exists on Mural. Um, if you want to like explore that and zoom in, but this is really just trying to break down all of the work that we're trying to do in the time frame that we have to do it, so folks understand where we're at, what we've learned, and where we're going, and what we still need to do. Um, so if you go to the next slide, I've created a, a simplified version of this to really kind of help us digest all of this. So we first gathered in November. And um, between December and January, we were really starting up figuring out what our process was going to be like um, and, and getting ramped up so that we could start ingesting all this information from subject matter experts. And so between February and June until now, you know, we've been doing a lot of learning from subject matter experts, reviewing the scientific literature and having our working group meetings. Uh, starting next month is when the real work begins where we're actually gonna be making decisions around some of these things and what are we actually gonna put into our final report. And we only have two months to do that. So we need to start really getting, getting lean about what we're gonna talk about, what we're gonna decide and what we're gonna put in our recommendations for the final report. And we basically only have between September and December to write all those recommendations up into our final report so that it can be submitted in January uh, to the legislature. Okay. So um, just to remind task force members, our legislative charge is to advise the legislature on the legal, medical, and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. Jess, if you could go back to the slide that it was on before, please. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, so in order to do this, we've been researching the therapeutic potential of MDMA, LSD, and psilocybin, comparing results from clinical trials with those three medicines to standard treatments that are already approved and used to determine if they are potentially more effective compared to standard treatments for specific conditions being evaluated in clinical trials with these psychedelic medicines. We're also charged with educating the public on the recommendations that we come up with at the end of all this work and to evaluate the regulatory and statutory changes needed to legalize these three medicines and figure out what legal pathways give us the most protection from conflicts with the federal government. So at a very high level, I just wanna summarize what we have gleaned so far from research reports from Dr. Johnson, as well as our various subject matter experts. So on the medical side, um, 
I think we've done a pretty good job of addressing duties one and two in the legislation around surveying clinical trials and comparing those with existing treatments. So Dr. Johnson's scientific research summarized that uh, first we saw in, what was it, April, that LSD may be useful for anxiety and problematic alcohol use. Um, in May, we learned about psilocybin and that it may be useful for mood disorders and problematic alcohol use as well. And this month, we're going to be learning more about MDMA and the fact that that may seem, soon be approved by the FDA uh, for treatment-resistant post-traumatic stress disorder. Okay, next slide. So the next slide is just a high-level recap of kind of the, the legal reality of what we're, we're talking about. So ultimately, all three of these psychedelic medicines are federally illegal at this time, uh, even though MDMA is potentially set to be FDA approved by August, um, if that goes well. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean that MDA, MDMA itself will be legalized. And so one of our charges was to kind of explore what are the, the legal realities that we need to grapple with and what keeps us in the least amount of conflict with the federal government. So aside from just waiting for FDA approval or doing more clinical trials, everything that we're exploring is federally illegal. And so what keeps us in the least amount of crosshairs with the federal government? Um, so kind of thinking about what's in the most in conflict to least in conflict with the federal government, obviously any kind of state regulated program, even though it would be kind of a closed loop system within the state, it is technically the most in conflict with federal law. Um, clinical trials would be the least in conflict, as I mentioned, uh, because there's already a, a legal pathway to do this that's already been done. It's all the research that we've been seeing so far. So to continue to do that would be completely legal. It's just fairly expensive. Um, waiting for FDA approval is another option. It just doesn't give people access until that process um, has been approved. So it is not something that's very timely for us to wait for, but it is kind of an option that is currently available and legal. Um, and then the next option we've been talking about is decriminalization, which isn't really applicable because it's actually just not enforcing a federal law, which is our right as a state to do under the Anti-Commandeering Act. Um, so that's kind of a very high level overview of kind of what we learned about in terms of the legal uh, pathways that we've been thinking about. But when it comes to policy analysis, um, as folks like, uh, you can go to the next slide, please. Um, as folks like Mason Marks have referred to this kind of policy analysis as what we're effectively doing and researching all these options. Um, this is where some of the state agency reps on the task force have weighed in and suggested that we may be straying a bit from what we are tasked with in the legislation. And we'll get into that discussion um, a little bit later with the help of our new vice chair, Bennett, uh, to provide an update on some of those concerns that were expressed recently in a closed meeting of just the state agency reps. So while I agree that some of these pathways we have been discussing are not explicitly laid out in the legislation, we cannot ignore the cultural implications that regulation of psychedelic medicines will have. Not only is there an existing culture of people with lived experiences that use these medicines that have been very vocal about how they would prefer that they are regulated and accessed. There are also spiritual and religious implications embedded in these cultures that need to be factored in and respected, which many states are ignoring in favor of medicalized models that feel disrespectful to the spiritual impact these experiences induce. Another confounding issue here is that while we are evaluating the medical implications of these three psychedelic medicines and potentially how they could be adopted in a medicalized setting, I want to point out that Minnesota has some of the worst health disparities in the country, despite having one of the best healthcare, healthcare programs. So this highlights a need in the vein of equitable and culturally appropriate care and access to look at alternative approaches to access that don't contribute to perpetuating such inequities in medicalized settings that harm a large number of people in the state, which is why we are looking into pathways for regulation and policies that help us determine what type of program would be the most accessible affordable, equitable, and culturally appropriate for everyone that maybe may want to use psychedelic medicines for healing purposes. So this again is a really high level overview of kind of some of the policy decisions that we need to start thinking about and making because a lot of other states that are trying to do this, either that have already passed legislation or trying to pass legislation, are coming against the barrier of cost and access um, to different programs that are trying to be developed in different states with psychedelic medicines. So what we're seeing is that state regulated programs seem to be the most expensive and the least accessible. Um, clinical trials are moderately expensive to, to do, um, but that's mostly on the cost of the people doing the trials, not necessarily to people participating in the trials. And they're somewhat accessible depending on the eligibility criteria of those trials. 
Uh, waiting for FDA approval is also something that could be moderately expensive to the end user or the client or patient, just given that we're uncertain how these things are going to be covered by insurance. Um, and the, the programs in Oregon are extremely expensive. Um, and again, somewhat accessible depending on what the eligibility is for those programs. And then lastly, decriminalization um, is the least expensive and the most accessible, um, but also doesn't really have any regulations around it. So it's <laughs> it's quick and easy, but it's also kind of a an uncertain space of like how things will be regulated and how safety will be accounted for. Um, so taking all of that into consideration, next slide, please. I wanna remind the task force that not only our legislative charge and duties of what we learned thus far um, is, is to do what I just mentioned, but we also need to be thinking about like, what do we still need to, to come up with? And so some things that we still haven't figured out are tribal law considerations, discussions with state licensing boards, because um, as we heard from the folks in Oregon, they didn't set up a dual licensure program. So people with any kind of state or federal license might be running into some issues around whether they can be a facilitator of a psilocybin or other psychedelic medicine services and not put their other licenses at risk. Um, and then hopefully identifying existing state agencies with overlapping infrastructure and oversight um, that can help us as we're writing our recommendations um, for the final report and what we can piggyback on that already exists and how we can keep costs and implementation down. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I wanna get into kind of going ab above and beyond a little bit of what the legislation has asked us to do and thinking about how are we going to write this into a report? How are we going to make decisions about what goes into the report and what our recommendations will be and reminding folks of our guiding principles that we have come up with at one of our earlier meetings to really help us in making our decisions and evaluating the information that we've been presented with and what we're gonna put into our report and our final recommendations. So just briefly to remind you, this includes um, evaluating scientific, uh, the scientific literature with uh, research with rigor. Um, and so using the best scientific data and evidence-based methods available to guide research and final policy recommendations get, and, and looking at other sources of information given the complexity of mental health treatment and the realities of policy change and operate with safety of people's medical, psychological, and spiritual health as the primary objective. Uh, the next is collaboration and inclusivity. So diversity in perspectives and experiences foster innovative solutions and strengthens our capacity to deliver results. Some perspectives have historically at times intentionally been excluded. We wanna be intentional in creating spaces for these voices. The next is accountability and integrity to act as effective and efficient managers of the public trust and public health operating with open communication, transparency, honesty, and timeliness to ensure appropriate high standards. The next is awareness and evaluation, recognizing limitations of existing research in the field and benefits of emerging or promising practices generated in community, continually addressing contradictions, disagreement, possible risks of bias, and any unknowns throughout the decision-making process. Consider member positionality and re reality of capacity throughout this work. Utilize opportunities to support where possible to ensure these biases are addressed and highlighted where needed and strive for the highest level of consensus throughout the evaluation process. We also wanna strive for practicality in our recommendations and aim to address the reality of implementing recommendations throughout the development process and creation of the final comprehensive plan. Consider possible barriers such as funding and other regulatory needs to ensure final recommendations are feasible and capable of being adopted into existing infrastructure to ensure sustainable long-term success. Next is social equity. Psychedelic medicine has a complex past rooted in culturally diverse histories, particularly within indigenous communities. This in conjunction with the impact of past drug policies provides a need to continually consider the future impact of recommendations while acknowledging past mistakes. Prioritize health equity, including culturally appropriate treatment options and identify possible unintended harms or injustices prior to submitting recommendations. And finally, engage the public whenever possible to continually engage in opportunities to center the voices of those most impacted by policy decisions. So next we're gonna go over to Mural and do a little exercise to talk about some of the decision-making tools that we um, came up with at our first meeting. Um, and then after we do that, I'm gonna take an opportunity um, to hand things over to Bennett to make sure that the state agency reps on the task force are feeling heard in this process so we can get some practical feedback on all the work we've done thus far and where we're going with all of it. 
Um, so first, let's start with the decision-making tools on Mural. So if I can direct everyone over to Mural. Um, we put those down into this month section, and we'd like to get everyone to weigh in by putting a blue circle under the options that you feel we should be using to make decisions about our recommendations. So recall, this is our final month of learning, and starting in July and August, we only have two months to come up with a set of recommendations that we're going to be putting into our report. So we need to really pivot into decision making and we need to come to a consensus on what types of decision making tools we want to use in order to figure out what are the things that we're going to put in our report. Um, so just know that we haven't made any decisions yet about those recommendations and that's what we're going to be doing next month. So um, Stacey, I'll turn it over to you if you have any additional prompts or instructions for folks to engage in this mural activity if I missed anything. I do. Thank you so much. And uh, just why don't you go ahead and stop sharing your screen so everybody can focus on their own mural. And I'm going to grab all of your um, everybody's attention here uh, so I know you're in the right spot. So I've grabbed control of your screen to put you where I want you to be members. Uh, and um, and as just said, what we're what we're thinking about now is how are we going to be making decisions together as a group? It's not always easy to do whatever the decision is. And so you'll see up on the top with the four orange boxes, there's some options that we had first unpacked at our very first meeting in your decision-making toolkit. Things like, gosh, do we need to use a, a SWOT analysis to weigh some options related to particular recommendation that's sitting in front of the group? Do we need to use a force field analysis? Um, and hang on, I'm just going to shut off cursors here because it's getting a little, it's getting a little noisy. There we go. Um, a stepladder approach where each member provides their personal opinion on specific topic in detail before a final decision is reached or made. You can see the different weighing options that might be useful to our group before we even get to a point of saying, okay, now it's time to make a final decision. I'll also point out um, the option for using uh, the five models of for ethical decision making. That was a contribution by somebody from this group. I don't remember who it was. And if you follow the arrow from the orange box to the blue box, I've given a description of those five models of ethical decision making. It may be that keeping in mind uh, perhaps a utilitarian approach or the common good approach weighs into how we together start talking about some of the decisions that are on the table. So as Jessica said, and Adam, I see your hand up, hang, hang tight, I'll get to you in a sec. I'd like you to help us think about what discussion or weighing options resonate the most with you by just grabbing a blue dot and popping it by the one, maybe two, that resonate the most with you. Once you're done with that, I want you to focus your attention down in the voting options in the yellow squares. We need to make a decision together about what is a decision. Is it totally unanimous? Everybody agrees. Is it a super majority? Is it a simple majority? So giving us some idea of what resonates with the most of you will be helpful as the leadership team uh, starts thinking about how to move forward over these next couple of pivotal months. So I see that you're starting to do that. Yay, thank you. I'll open up the floor to questions or clarifications and let's start with Adam. Go ahead, Adam. Thanks, Stacey. I am unfamiliar with the force field analysis in the weighing options. Yep. Can you explain that? Yep, there's a picture of it way up at the top of the mural from the first session. So if you go up to the very top in the toolkit, mm, Jessica, what is that area five up on the very top mural, the first day we met? I'll go yeah. up there too and look, yeah? Yep, so if you go way up to the top, you should be able to find it. It's a picture and it basically says, okay, in the center, we're gonna put the recommendation. And on the left, we're going to write down what's what's a, what's pushing against that particular recommendation. And on the right, what's pushing in favor of that recommendation. 
Once we have all of those ideas captured, then the group would go in and weigh, well, is it a little bitty force against, little bitty force for, or is it a big wall that would stop the group dead in its place? So that's a little bit about how that might um, help the group think through, well, is that recommendation even feasible? Don't know. So does that help you, Adam? Did you find it up on top? Uh, I was following you and oh. it looks like we just went over to the right. I was following you okay, on the roll. Hang on, hang on. I will go up there so everybody can see it. Hang on a second. Whoa, come back, come back. Sorry, I'm operating at a different computer screen today and it's just not always doing what I want it to do. So here we go. Here's area five with the decision-making tools. And Got right it. here, that's the force field analysis. Pretty simple tool, but sometimes it helps groups to see those forces against and for, and then weigh in there on just how significant are they. Yeah, I feel like it's similar to the SWOT analysis where it's like strength, mm -hmm. weaknesses, mm -hmm. opportunities, and threats, sort of just yep. like. Th that's yeah. helpful, thank you so much. Absolutely. Does anybody and else have any questions? Oh, Stacey, was that could, a follow you, could you return us to the of what maybe you don't have to pull everybody, but at least I want to follow you back to um, where the dots were. Yep, all the way down here. And whenever you're sick of me grabbing hold of your screen, just click anywhere on your screen and you break the hold. OK, so I'm going all the way down. There we go. There we go. And there's the box. And I'm going to go ahead and release all of you now. So you don't you don't have to be following me. Okay. All right. So we really, really appreciate everybody, all of the members weighing in on this information. And if you've got some other comments, particularly about the five models of ethical decision making, you can see that I set up some just blank white stickies to the right of that big blue box. Just grab a sticky. Write your thoughts there. We're just going to have some companionable silence here for a while to really have you have the time to help us think through how we're going to move through some decisions. Okay, so let's be comfortable in the silence here and let you think. So as you're working, I'm looking at what the output is. And I see a lot of interest in five models of ethical decision making. And that's begging the question for me, what about those five models? Is there one in particular? Why? How would you see the group approaching decision making or weighing their options? So really, give me as much as you got. So in about 30 seconds to a minute, I'm going to be really interested to hear from all of you about what you're seeing in these dot votes, dot information, I hesitate to call it voting right now, um, and what you think the implications are for how we're gonna be moving ahead then. Uh, Jessica, this is Rep Smith. Can I say something real quick? Or I have Absolutely. a question? Absolutely. Yep. Go ahead, Andy. Um, could you uh, break down what the actual numbers would be for a simple majority versus a super majority if we had quorum? Mm -hmm. I think that's helpful when it's not just a percentage wise to see like how many people are able to, you know, uh, vote no on something and potentially not have that passed. And that's important to consider whether we go with majority or super majority or something else. Yeah, it's a good question. And I'm frantically counting up, but I'm looking to see if anybody else on the leadership team has beat me to that two thirds majority of the total membership. Can anybody tell me where we are with that? Well, is that, is it whoever's attending that current meeting? And what, is it like the quorum or is it of the total members we have on the task force versus the total members that are in attendance at a given meeting? We could decide. I mean, we could establish that. Mm -hmm. 
So if you think about that, then you just need a simple majority of attendance to actually start or hold the meeting. If we've got, let's say, 18 members on the task force, no, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22-ish members on the council right now. So 11 present, super majority of that's two thirds. I can't do the numbers that fast in my head. It could be eight people. Is my math right? And I thought the simple majority would be slightly more than 50, break, 51%. 51. Mm -hmm. 12 people. 12 people, yeah. 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 But that would be, you're saying that is not who we have quorum on this meeting. That is if every member attended a meeting. If every member attended a meeting. Which I don't think we've ever had, just, you know, because that is how it works out. Yeah. I would think we should vote based on quorum. Um, and I'd be curious what those numbers would be based on, like, our average attendance. Yeah. Uh, which I think is probably somewhere around 15, but I, I don't know exactly. No. no. Well, so there's, so I do want to hear from the rest of you. If it was based on the attendance at a meeting when voting's going on, and it's either a simple or a supermajority, is that good enough for you? Or do you want to make sure every member has it had a chance to vote on something? Bennett, go ahead. What are your thoughts? Um, my thoughts are that we should take the vote based on who is present at the meeting. Um, because if there aren't enough people, say the group decides that it wants to make a decision by supermajority, well, mm -hmm. you know, what if there isn't a supermajority of the um, of the task force that's even present, then we go into that meeting knowing that it would be impossible for the task force to even make a decision. Now, that said, I do think it would be very important to uh, explicitly and, and repeatedly impress upon task force members that that will be the meeting at which we will be voting on what goes in the report um, to let people know that that is a, a very, very important task force meeting, maybe maybe the single most important task force meeting to attend. Uh, and then also um, let task force members vote, you know, by, by email or by proxy or something for people who just absolutely cannot attend. They have some other obligation, um, but they still have a, an opinion on the decisions. So that would be that would be my preference. Mm -hmm. Who else wants to weigh on on this verbally? You're also welcome. Oh, go ahead, Adam. Yeah, I would tend to agree with Bennett that if we set the majority or the supermajority as the total number of seats that are seated, we can do it. We could end up in a situation where like everybody agrees who's at the meeting, but we don't have that requisite number, which would be pretty bizarre. Um, so my, I, I personally voted for the thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in between um, model. But if we were going to go with a simple majority or a super majority, my thoughts are that it should be based on the number of people who are at the meeting, not based on the total number of people who have been appointed, who may or may not be present. Mm -hmm. Differing opinions, more opinions. Anybody else want to weigh in verbally? And I'll look to the leadership team. Do any of you have any other, <coughs> excuse me, follow up questions on um, what we've been discussing and weighing in on on mural i don't i just want to be mindful of time to get to the next section yeah okay and other leadership staff anybody have any follow-up questions as we take all of this information in and think about how we'll be preparing for the upcoming meetings okay so I'll invite, again, any of you members to reach out to me after the fact if you come up with another idea that might be useful. Um, these, I mean, it's tough getting to a point where we have to make decisions and we need to have a, a, a process in place that people are comfortable with. So if you've got more ideas, please loop back to any of the leadership team. We'd appreciate it. And with that, Jessica, I think I'll turn it back over to you for us to keep moving. 
Thank yeah. you, everyone. Appreciate it. Thanks, Stacey, and thank you to the members for providing your feedback on our decision-making tools. Um, so now I want to move on. We have another brief little mural activity um, regarding feedback from state agency reps. So we've not heard much from most of you during this process, and it's been unclear to me how best to get feedback from all of you and how you're feeling about the information presented thus far and the recommendations, suggestions we've come up with. We can only be as effective in crafting up potential recommendations as the information and data we're given access to. Um, and so it seems we're kind of coming into a situation where um, only a handful of people are being vocal about the information that's formulating our recommendations. And um, I would like to get more feedback from others um, instead of what seems like an echo chamber that's starting to develop. And we've heard, I think, enough from the same handful of people and we need, we need more information from other people. So this was initially why I tapped Bennett uh, for the vice chair role because I was getting the feeling that there is a communication wall up between the public and state appointed members and we're only hearing from the public members and none of the um, state agencies <laughs> that would actually need to provide information to help us figure out the logistics of the recommendations we're thinking about. Um, so I get that this is a weird topic and it can be uncomfortable to talk about openly uh, but we only have two months starting after this meeting to make all of our decisions about what will go into our final report. So now it's the time to speak up and express what you need from the task force to bring back to your agencies to get timely feedback for the working groups to use so we can gather the rest of the information we need to develop options that we can start making these decisions about next month. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Bennett, our vice chair, to summarize what that private meeting discovered and how we can move forward together. And then Stacy, that has a little um, prompt on mural, um, if folks could say what you need uh, from the task force process in order to give timely feedback on input and recommendations. So Bennett, you want to go ahead and summarize what you learned? Sure. Thank you, Jessica. Um, so last week, uh, I, as the representative of the Office of the Attorney General, and um, then the other representatives of state agencies in the task force met just to talk status update, um, very sort of high level general um, perspectives on the task force and, and on um, the research that we've heard and the discussions we've had and proposals we've been considering and everything. Um, and I just wanna say um, that we didn't take any like formal votes um, or, um, you know, sort of uh, crystallize any like formal decisions here. So this is, these are general impressions that I'm sharing. Um, and I just want to say, don't represent the like official opinion of state agencies as a group or any individual state agency or anything like that. So um, those qualifications out of the way, uh, the main kind of takeaways that I got from that conversation um, were, first of all, that the state agencies um, feel, uh, representatives feel that the task force has a, a difficult job um, in front of it, that any one of the drugs that we're evaluating could be its own task force, um, and that it is, uh, it's, the 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 task force is it, it makes sense that we're at a place where we're um kind of uh putting our, our foot on the gas trying to come up with recommendations in the next month or two um and that that's kind of a a difficult but manageable um uh issue just because of the difference in effect difference in um uh, depth of study and efficacy and application of of the three different drugs we're looking at. So that was the sort of um, the first perspective. Um, the second is that as representatives of the state agencies, one of the things that they feel they're on the task force to do is provide input on what their respective state agencies, what, what our respective state agencies would need or how they would respond to given proposals. But because we don't have concrete proposals yet, um, it's difficult to say what a given agency would do, how much money it would need, how it re would respond to a specific proposal, j just because we don't have any specific proposals yet. So like, would a, a given, um, you know, I'm, I'm just pulling an example out of a hat, would a proposal to uh, create a medical um, model for psilocybin-assisted therapy 
be governed by Office of Cannabis Management? Would it be governed by the Department of Health? Would it be governed by uh, pharmacy? Would it be some split of all of them? With, without, until we have more um, concrete information about what that would look like, the state agencies are kind of, on, on that piece of it, feel like they're in a holding pattern and just sort of waiting for more uh, specific information from the task force before they can say for sure what that would look like. Um, they definitely agree that some of the recommendations would be these are these are not impossible questions like for example if uh fda makes a recommendation to reschedule mdma from schedule one to maybe schedule three and then the dea is tasked with doing that rescheduling there are policies and procedures in place for what to do when a drug is rescheduled and so the state agencies feel, you know, for example, for something like that, that is something where it would be pretty straightforward for the state agencies, putting straight, straightforward in quotation marks here, straightforward for the state agencies to make those recommendations about like, okay, what does, what does the state do? What laws need to be passed? What actions need to be taken to respond to a rescheduling of MDMA? So they're, they're, they were looking at some of the proposals and saying, well, some of these we don't know. Um, there's, it's just too, there's just not enough information yet for us to say, but then there's some where they're like, well, but there, you know, there, there are some proposals where there's, it's going to be, they're, they're going to be able to give input on, on what this should look like. Um, okay. Conscious of, of the time that I'm taking, the last point that I want to, um, raise is that there was a feeling from some of the state agency members that adult, the proposal to, uh, consider adult regulated use of psilocybin as a general proposal goes beyond what the legislature has really given us the authority to talk about here. And, you know, not not just looking at like the specific language of what is defined as psychedelic medicine in the um, bill that created this task force, um, but like in the general directive of the task of the legislature, like look at the medical efficacy of these different drugs, look at creating a med medical regimen for it, uh, compare, you know, look at look at the public health. Um, I, I don't remember all the things off the top of my head that are in the um, in that bill that created the task force. But the state agencies say that it's it, it feels pretty clear that the legislature gave us a directive to look at a medical first model for a application of these different drugs. And that looking to a an adult regulated use, you know, whether for medical or for not, goes beyond the task force's directive. Um, and again, I, this isn't, we didn't take a vote and this isn't, you know, sort of a unanimous, you know, block of, of what all the state agencies feel, but that was definitely a, a strong feeling that was expressed to me. So I just wanted to share that with the group. Okay. Um, that's, that's my update again, conscious of the time. I'm going to shut my mouth and let other people talk. Thank you. Thank you, Bennett. Um, so Stacy, we do have, I don't know, we're a little bit over time and time for a break, um, but we did want this to be an opportunity that one of the things that we thought might be an issue is that maybe there's just an uncertainty around what information to take to an agency to get feedback to bring back to the task force, because I think we're worried that we're in a situation where we have a small number of people thinking of recommendations, and then the state agencies are not going to weigh in on that at all until it's almost finalized and we just have to vote on it. Um, but we're kind of in our last month of being able to do all that. So we just want to see in this last month of the working group, what information can the task force gather for state agency reps to bring to your agencies to help us get information of how to logistically implement some of these things that we're talking about. And also and a just question for, for Rep Smith, because you're the only legislator on the call right now in terms of like, do you have any uh, thoughts around what Bennett shared and kind of what are what is allowed? <laughs> to explore. And this is Stacy, Jessica, I'll, I'll expand it a little bit more beyond just what information you need in terms of the agency reps, but what, what else do you need in terms of task force process in order? Like, do you need a special discussion time? Do you need whatever it is? We, we wanna make sure that we're building um, 
the process as well as providing the information that you need in order to participate fully uh, from your agency's perspective. So we've got that big white box on the screen. We've got blue sticky notes down at the bottom. Please uh, put your thoughts in here. Uh, certainly if you're an agency rep, if there's some thoughts that uh, non-agency reps have that might be helpful to this, please add those. Uh, and if you'd rather just come on mic, please just raise your hand. And hey, Stacy, um, I went yep. to drag one of the blue boxes onto the um, onto the white box there, and it looks like it's maybe. Uh, did I the lock box. it down? Uh, 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 they're all uh, under the box, so I think you need to bring them forward. That's that's what I mean. Is they're they're mm -hmm. behind the box. Well, why are they there? You may all need to let me back up. You may just need to make a, make your own box. Let me see. Hang on. At this time, Rep Smith, do you have anything you want to add or uh, piggyback on? Yeah, I think uh, Bennett did a really good job of kind of summarizing uh, from a legislative perspective our relationship to the state agencies almost always. Um, they're really, really great, really, really helpful, and they, they need concrete, not just sort of slogans to know what how to implement this stuff. And they might have particular ideas about how that might be done, but um, they're all very good uh, uh, workers. And so they will subsume sort, sort of that thought, we have a recommendation. As the author of the legislation, I would say purposely was written sort of vaguely so that this, uh, this uh, task force could actually decide which is better and which is uh, you know, general legalization uh, to include some general legalization uh, while also doing a more medical model um, and sort of be able to make that decision, which is what we're going to do in the next month uh, to two months here as we barrel towards the end here. So I think, um, you know, that was the legislative intent uh, from the person who wrote the bill, um, but that is a decision we we have to make. And I think just to echo what Bennett said, I think the best thing to do is to give concrete, what if this, can we do this to the state agencies and their Really great. They'll able. They'll be able to recommend to us or show us how they think it might work. And Jessica, this is Stacy. Just for everybody's uh, purposes, I fixed that was my error on setup. So now you should be able to drag the blue box right on top of the white box and post it there. So go ahead. And I think it's area air, airy then Adam Ari then Ben Adam. Ari. Excuse me, Ari. Ari. Thank you. All good. Thanks, Representative Smith. That's really helpful. So I just want to. Uh, repeat what I think I just heard you said, which is that when you created the legislation, you weren't specifically thinking of like a medical pathway only, that you left open the possibility of doing like an adult use pathway as well, if that's what the task force wanted to propose. Is that accurate? That was the legislative intent. So I'll read kind of the key thing that we did for the purpose is to advise the legislature on the legal medical and policy issues associated with the legalization of psychedelic medicine in the state. Um, mm -hmm. So that, that's sort of trying to be as broad as possible while also creating some barriers to actually help us do some work. Got it. That's helpful. Yeah, because I see what the state agency folks are saying, that there is like a lot of text that's like laying out the like medical um, specifics of what you all wanted to see. But really, you're like, in intentionally leaving it open to allow a pathway for adult use if that's what the group wants to do. Thank you, so helpful. Thanks, sorry. Adam, Adam. Then we need to take a break. Yep, uh, just, I was essentially gonna do exactly what Ari did, just clarify with Representative Smith that this process we're in is within the legislative intent. I think that's really important. We've been having this conversation since the fall and I feel like we, we keep getting stuck in this conversation. So thank you, Representative Smith, uh, for being here to clarify that we are within the intent of the legislature. Thank you. And I, can I, sorry, I know we have to go on break. Um, Stacey or Jessica, can I just add one thing to that? Is also that legislative intent, intent does change, right? All we are going to do is recommend things to a new legislature that will be elected this fall. And they can take our recommendations, they cannot take the recommendations. Um, and so, there will be another chance for the legislature to make a call on this particular issue, probably many chances in the future, um, to to clarify if you know my legislative intent is not match the new legislature um, and sort of what they think about these issues uh, next year. 
Thank you. Bennett, did you have something else to say? I did. Um, this is a, a process question for Representative Smith. Um, let's say that you are reelected this fall and then you intend to carry a bill that, com that comes out of this report in the spring. Um, let's say it's you know, sort of November and into December and you are looking at the report and working with house research to start drafting language. Um, you're, you're finding co-authors, you're getting the bill ready to actually introduce and, and thinking about committees and state agencies and, and all that. Um, what Would it be useful for you to have a report that lays out multiple possible avenues um, for uh, even a, a single drug, for example, psilocybin, a report that gives a proposal for what a, an adult regulated use pr pathway could look like, what a um, what a medical, you know, sort of a supervised medical only pathway would look like. Would it be useful to have multiple proposals? And then part part two is, would it also be useful to have proposals that look out over more than just one legislative session that sort of look to like directing um, directing the regulation process over potentially many years? Different legislators might answer that differently. I would sort of say I would like the task force, and this is just my personal um, desire, to recommend the best possible thing that they think could exist. Because the legislature next year is under no obligation to take up any of the recommendations um, or any of the rules that we recommend to it as a task force. Um, just an example, Last year, there was a, uh, a a task force on local option sales taxes. There were some bills that got passed were part of the tax bill and then weren't. And eventually the legislator decided not to pick the, up those recommendations and no action was taken. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean in the future, there might not be more action taken with those recommendations. It just didn't happen right away. So uh, I think trying to game out what's gonna happen in the legislature is, uh, is a really hard for, you know, at the best of times. And I think we should, focus internally about like, what is the best? What would we want in Minnesota as the experts? And then it's up to people like me and also hopefully you guys still advocating once we get there to reach that in legislative session or sessions in the future. Thank you, very helpful. That's thing. Thank you so much. All right, let's take a brief 10 minute break and then we'll come back and hear Dr. Johnson's uh, MDMA research summary. So we'll come back at 10.53. Thank you everyone. Hello everyone, this is Jessica. If you can hear my voice, we're about three minutes left in our break. And I'll wrap up what you're doing and come back in three minutes. Thanks. And I think we're all systems go, Jessica. Yep, all right, it's 10.53. Welcome back everyone. Um, so we're gonna get started with the next, next section of our Psychedelic Medicine Task Force meeting. So I'm gonna turn it over to our psychedelic researcher, Dr. Caroline Johnson who's gonna give us an overview of MDMA clinical trials. So take it away, Carolyn. Thanks, Jessica. So today we're talking about the MDMA literature review. Like the last couple of months, um, I sent out a document with the details. And so today, again, we'll be focused a little more high level. Next slide, please. So here's a really quick overview of what we'll discuss today. <clears throat> I'll remind everyone of the health conditions we identified initially, We'll get into the research surrounding MDMA as a treatment for PTSD, both the phase three trials that have been submitted to the FDA and the phase two trials. Uh, we'll talk about some of the clinical risks of the drug and then we'll open it up for discussion. Next slide. So to review, our initial search identified the following conditions as potentially treatable with MDMA. Um, I've struck out tinnitus because there were no randomized control trials or RCTs that have tested it. There was one RCT each supporting the use of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as a treatment for social anxiety disorder in individuals with autism and for use in treating anxiety associated with a life-threatening illness. Um, but because most of the research is focused on the drug's use in treating PTSD, and because this is what has been submitted to the FDA in the context of, we'll just be discussing PTSD today. All of the information about the trials for anxiety though is in that overview document. Um, next slide, please. 
<clears throat> so we'll start with discussing um, the data from the two phase three trials. As a reminder, phase three trials are large scale studies that are built from phase one and two trials meant to gather more data on both the safety and the efficacy of a treatment and are required by the FDA for submission of a new drug application. So both of these trials, um, as well as the phase two trials that we'll discuss were associated with Lycos Therapeutics, um, which is the pharmaceutical arm associated with the Multidisciplinary Association um, for Psychedelic Studies or MAPS um, whom we are fortunate enough to have joining us today. Between these two studies, um, a total of nearly 200 people went through the treatment, and in both of the trials, the methods were the same. Um, participants were divided into two groups, either MDMA plus psychotherapy or placebo plus psychotherapy, but regardless of group, all the participants followed the same protocol. So each received three initial non-drug preparatory sessions three eight-hour treatment sessions with a team of two therapists and an overnight stay. And then after each treatment session, three integrative um, non-drug psychotherapy sessions. And so that's a total of nine integrative sessions um, across the trial. It was 18 weeks from the start to the end of each trial. During the first session, those in the MDMA group received 80 milligrams of the drug at the start of the session followed by an optional half dose about two hours later. At the second and third sessions, um, the dose was increased to 120 milligrams at the discretion of either the participant or the therapists, again with an optional half dose around two hours in. The main thing that the researchers were measuring was the change in PTSD symptomology, uh, which is done using an assessment called the Clinician Administered PTSD Scale, or CAPS. And so at the end of both studies, they found that those who went through the treatment with MDMA-assisted psychotherapy saw statistically significant reductions in their PTSD symptomology or their CAP scores as compared with those who got placebo. Um, and these participants who got MDMA also saw huge decreases in their symptoms when comparing just from the beginning to the end. Um, interestingly to note, Participants who got the placebo also saw um, some pretty big improvements in their symptoms. So that's a decrease in their CAP scores from beginning to end. And so something to kind of keep in mind about these trials is that this intensive psychotherapy component um, was developed by MAPS for these studies and isn't really considered standard treatment for PTSD. Regardless though, uh, both studies reported that more participants that received MDMA no longer met the criteria for a diagnosis of PTSD, and more were considered to be in remission than those who received the placebo. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> Four key phase two trials, um, again, sponsored by MAPS, occurred before these phase three trials. Um, because they were, again, largely the same methods, the group was able to run pooled analyses of those trials along with data from two of their unpublished studies. Um, and so these analyses are what I'll be talking about here. Pooled analyses are similar to meta-analyses in that they're the combination of trials, but they're used when there really isn't much variation in experimental methods. So one of these analyses um, evaluated data from the baseline to the primary endpoint of each study, and the other evaluated data from long-term follow-ups of those same trials. So from the end of the studies up to 12 months afterward. In the first analysis, they grouped data into two categories, those that received what they called the active dose, which was anyone who got 75, 100, or 125 milligrams of MDMA, and those who got 0, 25, 30, or 40 milligrams, which they called the control group. So if you remember, psychedelic studies are pretty difficult to get a true placebo group. And so sometimes these low doses are used as an active control to elicit the drug effects without presumably those therapeutic effects. And so between the you know, 100 or so participants that the data was collected from, they found that in the trials from baseline to end, those that received the experimental doses saw statistically significant reductions in their CAP scores so their PTSD symptoms. And the next analysis showed that those reductions continued in the 12 months following that last dose with those symptoms decreasing even more. 
They also found that more participants who received an active dose of MDMA ultimately lost the diagnosis of PTSD than those who were considered the controls. At the 12 month follow up, nearly all of the participants reported lasting benefits of MDMA treatment. Um, and those that reported negative effects also reported at least one benefit. Something to note kind of about this long-term data is that after these phase two trials reached their official endpoint, they opened up the treatment with the active dose to those in the control groups. Um, so at this long-term follow-up, all participants had received at least one session with a full dose of the drug. And so there was no control group at this time. Something else maybe to keep in mind about this long-term data is that nearly 10% of the participants reported taking MDMA on their own between that official end of the trial and the long-term follow-up. But the takeaway is that these studies, um, plus the two phase three trials, reported significant benefits of MDMA-assisted psychotherapy as a treatment for PTSD, which may last up to one year after treatment. Next slide, please. So our task then is to compare the efficacy of this treatment against current standard treatments. For PTSD, psychotherapies like cognitive behavioral therapy, prolonged exposure, and eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, among others, are considered standard. Additionally, uh, certain SSRIs or SNRIs can be used, but both the American Psychological Association and the Department of Veterans Affairs recommend psychotherapy over drug treatments. Looking specifically at the current treatments, a meta-analysis calculated that the psychotherapies, um, so that's the top three indented bullet points on the right, each have a large effect size, while the medications have a moderate effect size. If all of those therapies are statistically combined, compared to placebo, there's an overall moderate effect of treatment. Um, that's at 0.81 at the top. As a quick refresher, um, the effect sizes are the measure of the magnitude of difference between two treatments. So in these cases, between the treatment and the placebo, and the further from zero, the larger the effect. Two papers uh, compared the analyses of some of those phase two trials against results from meta-analyses of standard psychotherapies and medications, and calculated that the effect sizes for MDMA-assisted therapy were moderate to large. And the phase three trials found that when comparing between MDMA and placebo, the effect sizes were moderate approaching large. And remember, when looking just within a single group, the phase three trials found huge effect sizes when comparing between the beginning and the end in those that received an MDMA. And remember the individuals in the placebo group though also saw large effects of treatment from beginning to end. Next slide, please. Like with any treatment, uh, MDMA-assisted psychotherapy is not without its risks. Similar to the other two drugs we've talked about, most of the reported adverse effects were model, uh, moderate or mild um, and included things like headache, nausea, anxiety, and fatigue. Uh, with MDMA, there are also reports of a tightness of the jaw. Uh, some of these effects seem to linger up to a week after the treatment, but with decreasing intensity. In these clinical trials, there were reports of suicidal ideation, but because PTSD is a complex disorder, a fair amount of these participants had a history of suicidal ideation before starting the trials. In the phase three trials, these ideations were not reported to be exacerbated by MDMA, but in the phase two trials, um, suicidal ideation seemed to occur more in the active dose groups than in the control groups. Like the previous drugs, MDMA increases blood pressure, heart rate, and body temperature, um, which tended to be dose dependent. And this was true in studies on healthy individuals as well. Most of these effects return to baseline by the end of the session with no medical intervention. Unlike the previous drugs though, there have been reports that some of these adverse effects vary by sex. Um, but whether that's because the other drugs actually don't have these effects or because they didn't look for them is unclear. Either way, the negative effects of MDMA, including the subjective effects and hyponatremia, which is a low sodium content in the blood um, and which can be very dangerous, 
are reported more often in women, um, but this is potentially a dosing effect. A few last things to consider, uh, because MDMA interacts with the serotonin system, other drugs that modulate this system may interact with MDMA, including notably SSRIs, which may dampen the effects of MDMA, um, and antiretrovirals, which include drugs that treat HIV. In fact, uh, there have been a number of reported fatalities in response to taking antiretrovirals and MDMA at the same time. Like the previous drugs, uh, even though MDMA is in Schedule 1, there seems to be a pretty low potential for abuse, um, and clinical doses are far below those that are considered toxic. Typically, those pretty serious effects, um, the adverse effects, occur outside of the clinic in situations where the source or the composition or the dose um, is unknown. Finally, uh, something that we should talk about is a recent report put out by the International Clinical and Economic Review. So this nonprofit evaluates publicly available data of potential new drugs as an independent third party. Um, and they found a number of concerns with these trials, including issues of functional unblinding, expectancy of treatment, and boundary violations by therapists, among other concerns. I wanna point out that this report hasn't been peer reviewed um, and some of the points were based on hearsay, you know, so of course take it with a grain of salt, but it's out there so we should be aware of it. Um, and whether or not all of these claims are true, at least one of the concerns they brought up is something that we do need to think about as a task force. Um, and that is those reports of severe boundary violations by therapists. So people who have taken these substances, um, and particularly MDMA, are in a vulnerable state. They aren't acting or thinking like they normally do, um, and they can't give consent. And so we need to be aware that another risk of this treatment, um, and with all of the drugs that we've talked about really, is that the patient could be taken advantage of. Um, okay, next slide. So on that, <laughs> on that joyful note, uh, let's open up the floor uh, for a discussion and another mural activity. Um, and so like the last few meetings, we'll start at the top. Um, Jess, I might have you move to the mural activity. Thanks so much. Um, so like the last few meetings, we'll start at the top, right, with this kind of fundamental question of, do we want to recommend MDMA? Uh, you can use the blue dots around the edges to place in the no or the yes boxes. Um, and then from there, you can continue using those dots to indicate your thoughts, um, as well as any of the blue sticky notes for comments. Um, and so while you're doing that, you know, we also want to encourage everyone to discuss their thoughts. And as a quick reminder, um, this activity is anonymous um, and it's not a vote, it's not like official, it's just a visual aid for as we start making our recommendations. Um, and this mural activity will remain open for the rest of the meeting um, and the week uh, in case you need to think anything over. Um, and I see that there are a number of hands, uh, so we'll start with Jessica. Thank you, Caroline. This is a really great presentation and the report was as always very stellar and comprehensive. <laughs> I had a question because I was noticing, and I know that this isn't the, that the psychotherapy component devised by Lycos or PVC was not the same as like cognitive behavioral therapy exactly. Um, but I noticed that the effect sizes uh, sort of within the within subjects group for that placebo group versus what um, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy was, were very similar. And I know when they were initially designing this, they were thinking of MDMA as an adjunct, as something that would enhance existing effective therapies. And so I think we're seeing that. But what I'm curious about from the CBT meta-analysis is, it's just on its own, um, is that for like a single CBT session for repeated CBT sessions? Do you have a sense of kind of what the dose was for that? And if that was also evaluated as a within group type thing, or was it compared to some other type of treatment? It was not single. It was not like a single session. It was, you know, th there, there were a number of trials that looked at it. And so it was whatever their, you know, start to finish was a couple sessions. I think some you know, had eight sessions, some had four sessions, you know, it was, it was kind of comparable in that it was many instances of CBT. Um, I didn't see if they pulled out within groups, I saw that they just compared between groups. Um, but that's also something that 
I know is out there that we just have to find. Thank you. I think uh, Nick was next. Hey, Carolyn, great job as always. I just, I just had a question about the phase two and phase three trials when they talk about um, statistically significant reduction in symptomology. You know, if it, as, you, as you know, like, you know, the criteria for um, PTSD uh, is sort of like really extensive and very long. There's like eight different categories. And so I was wondering if you could describe a little bit more about what they meant by reduction in symptomology and if they had sort of a systematic way of, of looking at that. Yeah, they, they looked at the CAP scores. Um, so they looked at the reduction in your total CAP score. Um, I don't have it on the top of my head, but I know that it is in that document. They had a cutoff and I think it was, you know, less than or equal to 11 points or, you know, a drop of 10 points, something similar, but they did have kind of a, an a priori cutoff on this is what we mean when we say statistically significant. Okay. That helps. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, let's see. Next in my queue is Adam. I, I just want to, I'm going to put on my public safety hat for a moment here um, to Caroline mentioned the extreme boundary violations. Um, please know that's already criminalized in the state of Minnesota. If somebody is um, assaulted while they're mentally impaired or mentally incapacitated or by a psychotherapist who's treating them or recently treated them, like that's already a crime. Thankfully, those laws are expansive. I don't believe that our task force needs to like dig deeper into that and find more more ways to prohibit that type of deplorable behavior. Thank you. Thanks, Adam. Uh, I see Renji is next. Fantastic uh, presentation, Caroline. I was just going to add on to what uh, Jessica had mentioned. In the CBD trials, usually it's not a one-time sort of therapeutic sessions. It's a series of sessions that might encompass five to 10 to even more, depending on how what the symptom reduction is made on CBT. And that goes along with prolonged exposure as well. Second point is um, when we think about PTSD, we don't think of PTSD as sort of a silo diagnosis. It can happen that way, but the use of adjunctive medications for PTSD might include PTSD comorbid, comorbid with things like generalized anxiety disorder, major depressive disorder, sleep disorders that are combined with PTSD. So we should look at, I agree that medications on its own don't necessarily get to the core of the PTSD itself, but when we use medications, we're sort of symptom symptomatically reducing um, uh, you know, associated symptoms that go along with the PTSD. Third point, Adam, totally agree, boundary violations occur already in these sort of uh, in in therapeutic sessions unfortunately but to caroline's point and subtle but i think we really need to message this clearly and for our legislators to understand this and the public these medicines do create a vulnerable state people become very vulnerable and they're suggestible in these states so violations can theoretically increase or probabilistically increase especially if you don't vet folks that might be facilitators in a way that that really decreases the chances for that. So while this occurs, it can occur in patients that are not in a vulnerable or, or suggestible state. When you add these medications to the mix, that's it's it's just a, a significant increase in potential. And I'll I'll end with that. Excellent. Thanks, Renji. Um before I move on to Bennett, I want to uh, echo point two that some of these, there's kind of been follow-up trials that look at these comorbidities um, and you know they're finding that it helps with sleep disturbances, it helps with eating disturbances, it helps with substance use disturbances. Um, so we didn't really have time to get into that, but it, it kind of does help the, the comorbidity around PTSD. Um, so we'll move on to Bennett. Well, thank you. Um, I have two questions about uh, what you've seen and getting into um, into the details of these trials. One is uh, on, on the question of consent and, and uh, abuse, what methods of obtaining consent did the different studies use? Is there a set, um, 
you know, criteria for consent that they, you know, written consent or verbal consent ahead of time. I've seen, um, I've seen discussions about sort of dual consent where a person must give consent for a particular action, both ahead of time before they've received the drug. And then also while during the session itself. Um, so that my first question is about what the, what the different means of consent obtained were in some of these studies that, that stick out to you. And then my second question is about um, specifically how these studies um, selected for um, cardiovascular issues, because unlike psilocybin and LSD, MDMA is an amphetamine and has an effect on the cardiovascular system. Um, and so one of the risks that is out there is, is risk of, you know, like a heart attack at sort of the extreme end, but also like just sort of cardiovascular issues in general. So I'm wondering how they, um, the, the studies runners selected for for that health uh, component? Th those are my two questions, thank you. Great questions, I'll work backwards. Um, so in all of these drug trials, they have screenings up front for, you know, if you are comorbid for certain heart conditions based on your medical history, if you have comorbidity for certain um, psychiatric disorders, if you, you know, certain personality disorders, there's a whole host of medical screening that goes on before people are even allowed into the trials. So they do screen for, you know, certain heart conditions that seem more likely um, to produce negative effects. And so we're not seeing any participants who have comorbid heart conditions. Um, backwards onto the consent, you know, this might be a really good question to ask the representatives now that they're here, we'll be hearing from them next. Um, from what I understand, there was discussions of consent beforehand um, a, a lot of my information is kind of secondhand, but there were kind of like safe word type situations. Um, so discussing ahead of time, um, everything was video monitored. Um, so there was kind of a lot of discussion around consent that we might want to ask them what their specifics are um, more specifically, I suppose. Yeah, just to piggyback on that, Caroline, just from my experience with this, you know, usually you have a very detailed informed consent when they enroll, when they decide to sign on to be a participant in the trial. And during the preparatory sessions, you go over boundaries around touch and support. And a general rule is that once they're under the drug, they cannot revoke consent, they can't modify their consent. So the idea that they can't give consent during the drug dosing session, because that's they're in an altered state. So if they have agreed that you don't they don't want to be touched in the drug dosing session they can't say okay you can touch me now those kinds of things are very clearly stated at the beginning before any drug is given um and those are adhered to pretty pretty strictly thank you jessica um okay i see uh rep smith hi thank you dr johnson that was an excellent um presentation maybe just one comment off of what was just said then i actually have two questions i'll try to go quick I know we're tight on time. One is just as we're moving towards the recommendation phase, I think it's good to say, as we're talking about this consent, this is one of the things talking to licensing boards that we need to have very clear restrictions on if we're going to license people for this and how they're going to oversight that. But as a legislator, I'll say also the more robust the licensing board is as far as what they need to check and how often, et cetera, the more expensive getting a license is going to be, which is what we've heard is a, is a, hardship in Oregon. So it's just kind of all these things that we've talked about coming together in these hard decisions. Um, to that question, just on uh, Dr. Johnson, my first question is about the actual cost of these dosages, uh, doses, excuse me. Uh, so 80 milligrams to start out and then 120 milligrams for the second and third sessions. Um, what is the, the cost of supplying uh, these doses, if they were, and this may be outside your scope, um, but uh, a rough idea compared to like an SSRI or other um, uh, medications or treatments that are used. So in the, in that um, ICER report, they kind of use a rough estimate starting, I think at like $10,000 um, for something like that. So while I don't know the specifics of cost, it will be much more significantly expensive than SSRIs. Um, a lot of that cost goes into 
uh, the two therapists over 42 hours. So you, you know, if you got over 80 hours with um, presumably licensed facilitators, which is going to be a very expensive thing potentially. Um, so that that's the answer to your first question. Um, your second question? Yeah, that's helpful. And I know probably around you would like to talk about how group sessions can save some money um, around that. But we'll, uh, uh, my second question is uh, more on the outside of clinical trial question, because we have that sort of in our in our breakdown. Um, you you touch on you touch on this briefly about low abuse potential, low potential for toxicity. Um, but I'm curious if there is, is broader research on if MDMA is legal, not just in clinical settings, but just uh, overall um, potential increases in some of these things. And again, especially compared to things that are legal currently, right? We know alcohol has uh, abuse potential and, and marijuana now is, as well, as well as a, a, a bunch of different substances. Uh, do you have any idea of how MDMA would stack up as far as potential for abuse outside of a clinical setting? I don't really know, just to be forthcoming. Um, we're not in a situation where we can look at other data. Nobody else has legalized this, so we can't really compare. Um, you know, it's already out there. People are already using it, and I, you know, they're probably not going to go to a clinical source to get it. So I don't know if the clinical sources would would you know, affect that much. We know that for psilocybin in Denver, we haven't really seen increases in, in negative aspects. You know, people aren't really calling the poison control. They aren't really, you know, going, going to the emergency room over it. Obviously these things aren't necessarily the same. Um, so we don't really have a good baseline of what that would look like if this drug was legalized. Um, but, but typically right now, the, the reason these drugs can be so have adverse effects is because you don't know the source and you don't know if something is mixed in with them um, to answer that question. Thanks, Carolyn. I do want to be mindful of time. We want to move on to our, a lot of these questions I think can carry over to the Lycos folks because um, we do need to get moving. Um, I will say that there are kind of we're not evaluating anything that's not a randomized controlled clinical trial, but there are survey studies. There's a national survey of drug use and health, which is an annual effort to collect data on what people are using in terms of substances and how their mental health is. Um, there's the global drug use survey. There's all these kinds of things that can give a sense of like, how much are people using these? What kind of adverse events are happening? They're just not within this kind of pre-prescribed RCT that we've decided to evaluate in the scientific literature, but that information does exist. Um, but I do want to move on. Thank you, Caroline, for your presentation. Um, for folks that still have questions waiting, keep those in your queue and we'll ask them to the Lycos folks. But I do want to turn it now over to our special guests from Lycos Therapeutics, who are going to talk about the FDA approval process for MDMA. So I'd like to welcome uh, Gretchen Schwab, Associate Director of State Government Affairs at Lycos Therapeutics, and Benjamin Everett, the Senior Director of Medical Affairs at Lycos. So if you both want to come on camera and um, give your talk, we thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise with our group. Thank you so much. Thank you so much yeah, for absolutely. having Absolutely. Thank you. If we can, I've actually got a PowerPoint version of the slides that might make a presentation a little bit easier. If it'd be okay if I can share. I think that should work. Let's see. Not that one. All right. Gretchen, you want to start us off? Can everybody see the slides, first of all, I should say? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you all so much for your time today and, and letting us present and introduce uh, where we are in the process and um, how we are working through the regulatory environment to hopefully make mitomethetamine assisted therapy uh, an approved prescription product for patients with PTSD. Um, I'm going to kick this over to Ben for now uh, to walk through some of what might feel redundant, but um, we'll move quickly so that we can uh, field any questions that you all might have. And I will um, wrap this up with where we are within the regulatory process right now. Yeah, thanks, Gretchen. Um, so I want to acknowledge Dr. Johnson, what a great job you did going over uh, phase two, phase three research. So some of this might be redundant, 
I think I'll try and go through a lot of this uh, a little bit quickly so we can reserve more time for uh, for questions. I think the main thing I want to emphasize on this front slide is that, you know, medomophetamine assisted therapy is currently under review by FDA. So this is still investigational. So we won't be making any claims as to efficacy or safety at this point in time. This is not improved in, in any country for any uh, use. And then we are at Lycos, we're very, um, can, uh, very uh, focused on making MDMA assisted therapy a medical model. So not, you know, we're, we're, we're we're not looking at doing what is being done in, in Colorado, uh, uh, um, Oregon, and, and other states like that. Um, back up a little bit and let you know a little bit about MAPS Public Benefit Corporation or, or Lycos Therapeutics. We did a rebrand earlier this year. And so what we, we are looking for a world where all appropriate patients have the opportunities to heal and grow through the use of psychedelic medicine and therapies. We are a public benefit corporation, and as such, we have a charter to do public good and uh, that essentially puts patient um, outcomes ahead of company profits. Um, that said, we are allowed to operate as a for-profit industry, um, but we have uh, a built into our charter as well as um, uh, just legal requirements on the way that we go about and transparency around how we spend whatever profits we might make. Uh, at this point in time, we are still non-profitable. We don't have a product on the market. Um, so with that, you can see our core values here are centered around impact, openness, integrity, and care. Um, so really transition just quickly into PTSD. So we have focused on PTSD for a number of reasons. We feel that medomophetamine is especially well-suited to, uh, to treat trauma-related um, um, uh, diseases and disorders. And we could get into that in Q&A if anybody wants to. Um, but PTSD is chronic and disabling. It can involve considerable uh, social, occupational, and interpersonal dysfunction. Um, about 70% of patients have moderate to severe symptoms. And this is not just a disorder that affects the patients. It also affects their families, their caregivers, and their peer group. Uh, estimated total U.S. prevalence is approximately 13 million. That has increased by 1 million since the pandemic and is expected to continue to increase due to the uh, burden of, of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, very common to see a number of psychiatric comorbidities, um, uh, very common to see comorbid major depression, alcohol or substance use disorder, uh, suicidal ideation, other things like that uh, were, were mentioned previously. Total economic burden associated with PTSD, and this is still, I consider a state-of-the-art publication, is put at $232 billion per year. This is actually numerically more than we spend on cardiovascular disease in the United States. Uh, but given the very difference in incidence and prevalence between PTSD and cardiovascular disease, you can see we are really spending a lot of money per patient on PTSD. And frankly, we don't have very good outcomes. With less than 50% of patients remitting, uh, whether they get psychotherapy, pharmacotherapy, or a combination of both. Um, so really, I just hit on this, but uh, it can be very difficult for a patient to get a diagnosis of PTSD. Um, just lack of general awareness. You know, patients might have some trouble sleeping, might have some anxiety. They start with an urgent care or a general practitioner. They might be put on a, a sleep aid and, and an SSRI and not really understanding or exploring the under, underlying cause of, of their anxiety or their disordered sleep. Um, so with that, it's estimated that of the 13 million total patients, only about 5 million are diagnosed. That leaves about 8 million patients undiagnosed with PTSD. Um, hit on this earlier, but the CAPS-5 score is the gold standard for clinical research in PTSD. It was developed by the VA. Uh, it is now in its fifth iteration. Uh, it was last revised to be lockstep with the DSM-5 uh, when it was last rev uh, revised. So you can see there are about eight different uh, buckets or domains of symptoms. Uh, and patients are, are assessed a score of zero if those symptoms are not present at all, all the way up to four for extreme or incapacitating. And so you'll see typically mild, moderate, severe, but extreme PTSD is actually um, very common. And we studied a large, a large number of patients with extreme PTSD in our phase three studies. But again, about two thirds of patients uh, qualify as having moderate to severe PTSD. Indicated earlier, um, kind of how patients are treated with per PTSD. So psychotherapy is the is the first um, 
recommendation for how to treat patients with PTSD. That said, only about a third of patients get psychotherapy only, about a quarter of patients get pharmacotherapy only, and a, less than half of patients get a combination of both. Important to note, there are only two drugs that are currently FDA approved to treat PTSD, and those are the two SSRIs, sertraline and paroxetine, um, a number of antipsychotics, other antidepressants, SNRIs, mood stabilizers can be used to treat uh, uh, PTSD off-label. And regardless of, of what uh, modality or combination of modalities patients receive, as I indicated previously, about 56% of patients fail to recover from their PTSD. And this can be due to you know, variable efficacy, delayed onset, challenges in care, and, and, and just very high dropout rates for psychotherapy. For pharmacotherapy, limited efficacy uh, requirement for daily use and untoward side effects, uh, among others. All right, so moving into MAP1 and MAP2. So these are our two phase three studies. I'm not going to spend any time going through the phase two studies other than to say that based on that pooled analysis that Dr. Johnson presented, we applied for as a sponsor for breakthrough therapy status for MDMA-assisted therapy, and that was granted back in 2017. Because of our breakthrough therapy status, we were able to develop our protocols for, uh, for, for studying this for patients with uh, moderate to severe or really extreme PTSD in collaboration with the FDA. And so FDA has already vetted power calculation, primary, secondary, exploratory endpoints, um, all, all the things that go into this. Um, but some disclaimers. So I mentioned earlier, uh, still investigational, not currently approved. Um, if it is approved by FDA, the approved label will ultimately determine the appropriate use of the product, which may differ from or exclude some elements of the data from the presentation. Uh, and this is really just for your background use. Uh, and you know, we'll, we'll be happy to come back uh, if and when we receive FDA approval. All right, so just to go through the protocol uh, quickly, uh, again, this was developed in collaboration with the FDA. We consider this an acute, an acute treatment protocol. It occurs over approximately 18 weeks. In the real world, this could happen in as quickly as about uh, uh, 10 to 12 weeks, um, but could drag out longer just for access issues and, and scheduling. Um, these were both randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled, multinational studies of adult patients with longstanding moderate to extreme PTSD. Eligible patients were randomized one-to-one -to, -one to either placebo-assisted therapy or medomethamine-assisted therapy. Uh, the participants are paired with the therapy dyad for the entire uh, study protocol, so they meet with the same two uh, therapists or qualified healthcare practitioners um, through, the do uh, through the duration of the, uh, of the protocol. And then each treatment cycle consists of a dosing session and three integration sessions. Um, First patients do go into three preparation uh, sessions that were mentioned by Dr. Johnson. Uh, some questions uh, came up earlier about uh, informed consent. Um, on top of the written informed consent that goes into just being eligible for the study, um, those preparation sessions cover a number of different informed consent, and those things are documented. For example, the use of therapeutic or grounding touch while a patient is under the influence of, of either MDMA or placebo, because as noted earlier, those need to be established uh, on the front end and can't be changed during the dosing session. Uh, so in cycle one, patients receive a split dose of 120 milligrams of MDMA or placebo. This is 80 milligrams followed by 40 milligrams about 90 minutes later. Important to note that we do consider this a split dose at this point in time due to the fact that very few patients, about 98% of patients, did opt to take the, uh, the, the supplemental dose, and we expect that's how the label will read. In cycles two and three are exactly the same, except patients receive 180 milligrams total as 120 plus 60 about 90 minutes later. All the preparation integration sessions were 90 minutes in length, while dosing sessions last six to eight hours. Uh, endpoints were assessed throughout the trial by blinded raters. And this is very important due to the functional unblinding nature of, of psychedelic uh, medicines. A primary endpoint, as, men, uh, as mentioned earlier, was a change from baseline to end of, uh, end of treatment of MDMA-assisted therapy versus placebo-assisted therapy, as noted by CAPS-5. All right, so 
With that, we'll go into uh, some of the inclusion and exclusion criteria. Uh, exactly the same with the exception of uh, in map one, we looked uh, just at severe to extreme PTSD. And in map two, we did lower the threshold for CAPS-5 uh, baseline score to include some moderate patients. All patients had to be adult. They had to have symptoms for at least six months and uh, had, the, had the, the CAPS-5 scores as noted there. Um, in terms of exclusion criteria, primary psychotic disorder, bipolar one, dissociative uh, identity disorder, eating disorders, major depression with psychotic features, personality disorders, current alcohol or substance use disorders, pregnancy or lactation, or this gets to the cardiovascular issue that came up earlier. We excluded patients that had conditions that could be ex uh, exacerbated by increased blood pressure or heart rate. That said, there were patients that had uh, cardiovascular histories that were in, uh, included in the trials. They were just sent to a cardiologist for, uh, for, for checkout and essentially to ensure that the, the cardiologist felt that they were safe to go into the study. This was not a very large number of patients, but we did have some of those patients. In terms of uh, baseline characteristics, you can see map one on the left and map two on the right, kind of a busy slide, so I apologize for that, but this is essentially how they came out of the published studies. Um, uh, you can see the mean age is approximately 40 years old, um, fitting with the natural history of disease. This is primarily female, so about two thirds female. Um, in ethnicity and race, we did a much better job very intentionally in increasing the racial and ethnic diversity in map two than map one. You can see the mean duration of PTSD, about 15 to 16 years. The dissociative subtype was especially treatment refractory, uh, about 20% of patients. You can see nearly all patients have comorbid major depression. Nearly all patients have a history of suicidal ideation or action. Um, in terms of prior SSRI exposure, about a quarter of patients had prior SSRI exposure. And when we look at MAP-1, the mean baseline CAPS-5 score is about 44. This indicates closer to extreme PTSD. Uh, and you can see very high levels of comorbid depression for those patients that had a history of comorbid depression. Uh, in MAP-2, we, did a, uh, we reported a little bit more clearly the trauma history, but you can see it's developmental combat, veteran status, or multiple traumatic events for most of these patients. Uh, baseline CAPS-5 score here is, even though we intended uh, intentionally included more moderate patients, was still high, and this very much trends to the severe category of CAPS-5. And you can see the breakdown there. About a quarter to 30% of patients had moderate disease. All right, so with that, let's get straight into the primary endpoint. So just to orient the graphs, MAP-1 is on the left, MAP-2 on the right. The top blue line with the triangles is placebo-assisted therapy. And really, I love this because this goes to show that when trauma-informed therapy is done in, this, in, 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 in practice with very skilled therapists, you can get a very nice response to these patients with PTSD. And they have about a 14 to 15 point drop in their, in their CAPS-5 score. And so it's interesting to note that a 10 point drop in CAPS-5 was considered a priori as clinically significant or clinically meaningful. So that's really good. However, when we pair the MDMAT or the MDMA with the assisted therapy, we can see a much larger drop in the baseline uh, from baseline in CAPS-5. These are highly statistically significant and have a very nice effect size in terms of the treatment effect that this has. And so the MDMA assisted therapy uh, did, you know, what was shown to be in both studies, uh, highly statistically significant and uh, much more effective than placebo-assisted therapy. The other thing you'll note between the two studies is just how uh, well-matched they are um, in, in terms of the results. There's no real outlier from one study to the other, uh, with the deltas in both placebo-assisted therapy and MDMA-assisted therapy being very similar. In terms of our key secondary endpoint was the Sheehan Disability Scale. In this scale, a four-point uh, decrease indicates clinically uh, relevant symptom improvement. And again, you'll see placebo-assisted therapy did well, uh, so about a two-point drop. The MDMA-assisted therapy patients did about 50% better with a three-point drop. So this, is not, uh, this did not meet the, the threshold for clinical significance. However, it was statistically significantly better than placebo-assisted therapy. All right, to balance this out with 
uh, with safety, very important here. Um, you know, as was noted earlier, this is a uh, MDMA is a sympathomimetic. And so there are a number of things that uh, are associated with the drug. These tend to be acute and transient. They all respond spontaneously or resolve spontaneously by the end of the day. You can see muscle tightness, decreased appetite, nausea, feeling cold, restlessness, bruxism, nystagmus, uh, increase in blood pressure, uh, non-cardiac chest pain, all being higher than placebo. There were in MAP1 two participants in the placebo group with three serious adverse events uh, that comprised of suicide attempts or ideation, which resulted in self-hospitalization. There were no SAEs of that nature reported in the MDMA group. Um, and then I just covered that down at the bottom uh, in terms of suicidality, uh, in terms of cardiac events that could indicate QT prolongation, one in the placebo group, none in the MDMA assisted group. And in terms of looking at misuse, abuse, or diversion of study drug as noted in the 18 week protocol here, there was none. Um, in MAP2, we see really very similar types of, uh, uh, of, of findings. Um, just to look at the right now, most participants did experience at least one TAE, seven parents experienced, seven participants experienced severe treatment emergent adverse events. Uh, none were serious. The most common were consistent with the previously reported effects. When we look at suicidality, was well matched between the two groups. And again, um, you know, the data are what the data are here. Cardiac events that could indicate QT prolongation, four in the MDMA assisted therapy group versus one in placebo. And again, zeros in the misuse, abuse, and diversion of study drug. So with that, I'll cook it over to Gretchen and let her finish out the presentation. Ben, um, so in terms of where we are uh, now, we submitted our new drug application to the FDA after completing our phase three clinical trials back at the end of 2023. Um, FDA accepted our new drug application and granted us priority review, which um, gives us a potential approval date of August 11th. Uh, that is a Sunday. FDA does not typically work on the weekends. So internally, we anticipate that we will um, likely have a decision from FDA as early as Friday the 9th of August for approval. Um, because this is a Schedule One drug, uh, if we do receive approval from the administration, we then go into a rescheduling process with the Drug Enforcement Agency. Um, there is still decision-making um, happening behind the scenes in terms of what exactly will be rescheduled, but we ultimately have presented the data in our package um, for mitomethetamine for PTSD. Um, so 90 days post potential approval would be when we will hear from DEA about um, essentially the rescheduling from one to um, what's anticipated between a two and a three. Um, the Controlled Substances Act has five schedules. So one being the most restrictive, no medical use to five being the least restrictive. Um, We won't know until probably mid-November because DEA does have 90 days post-approval um, based on a, a new medical use. And then once federal rescheduling is accomplished, all 50 states have their own rescheduling processes in place for controlled substances um, and we are starting to do the work. We have been doing the work for a couple of years in anticipation of this in um, certain states that have more challenging rescheduling processes. Uh, there's a, a pretty diverse landscape in terms of legislative requirements, regulatory or administrative changes that have to be made. And the areas of jurisdiction vary across states as well. So um, navigating that appropriately and uh, within the resourcing that we have, which is also uh, why we're excited to be here today. We've been doing a lot of education around our product, 
the model, um, understanding what it looks like to have um, hopefully an FDA approved product coming from schedule one to a lower schedule for medical use as a prescription product. Um, and that feeds into our anticipated uh, launch timeline that is subject to change depending on a, a lot of factors, honestly, but um, in the immediate uh, tomorrow, we have an FDA advisory committee meeting, which is um, the first for PTSD in 25 years. We are very excited at the opportunity to present all of this information to an expert panel within FDA for review. Um, there is an anticipated risk evaluation and mitigation strategy, um, as well as label considerations that will be put into effect um, should we get approval. And that will also dictate how we think about where this will be delivered based on uh, medical credentialing, facility credentialing, um, and clearly uh, moves us into the roadmap for our commercial success and how we're thinking about um, being able to make a prescription treatment for PTSD available and broadly accessible for patients um, across various types of insurance coverage and different geographies. Uh, given all of the regulatory considerations and legal considerations, as well as um, just really thinking about the existing healthcare system and medical model, rolling in a new treatment option into existing systems, um, all play a role in what our launch will look like if we do get approval and and understanding where DEA lands and then working individually uh, state to state to to best kind of understand again where this should be rolled out and any additional resources necessary to make this a successful treatment option for patients with PTSD. So I will leave it there for now and um, open to questions. Thank you so much, Gretchen and Ben, for sharing all that with us. All right, so we'll open it back up to the task force members for questions. Go ahead and raise your hand and we'll get the queue going. Yeah, Renji. Thank you both for your fantastic presentation. Um, really excited about this. I've been following the work for a while now. And I'm glad you mentioned the REMS program, the Risk Evaluation Mitigation Strategy in, as part of this. And <clears throat> question whether you can answer it or not. The Well, first, in just to provide education for the rest of the group, and, and I want to be clear that I'm uh, um, correct about this, the dyad therapy groups that were instituted in the research protocols included both a at least one female in the diet group. And I would like for you to sort of perhaps answer why that would be important in the, the process. That would be one. Two, would that be also a recommendation in the REMS program? So I'll, I'll, I'll start. So first of all, and I went really fast to the presentation, so I hope everybody followed, but I wanted to make sure we had enough time for, for questions and didn't want to be too redundant. So um, there's a lot of history in psychedelic medicine going back to 50s, 60s, and 70s of having uh, a mixed um, you know, sex or, or, or gender dyad in the group. And we started that way going into, into phase two. Um, we did subsequently switch to, it was just kind of the, you know, the way it was at that study protocol. So in some cases, it might've been two females. In some cases, it might've been two males. In some cases, it was one and one. Um, we don't want to try and regulate this and don't expect that the label or the REMS will, will go to this because especially with therapy, the therapeutic alliance is so important. We know that PTSD is, is two thirds female and two thirds sexual violence and domestic violence. And so a lot of patients would not be comfortable probably going to you know, a man or, 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 two, or two men. And so we hope that this remains open enough uh, and there's uh, equitable access for all patients to find who they would want to find in their, in their 
in their therapy and provider team. Thank you. Bennett? Thank you both for um, that uh, great presentation. I have two questions. Um, one, I would like to know um, what Lycos is uh, doing or, or what its response is to the um, the report by the Institute for Clinical and Economic Review recently that found the um, that its phase three trials are are insufficient to show proof in in treating uh, PTSD. And then my other question, and I'm sorry, these are both uh, rain on parade questions. Um, my other question is if um, I, I've heard a lot of uh, a lot of discussion around the FDA meeting in August, and that the expectation is that. It, uh, MDMA will be rescheduled. Um, if it weren't rescheduled, if that if FDA says, um, you know, go back to the not go back to the drawing board, but we you know we need more we need more evidence, or the um, phase three trials had these, you know, categorical design issues that we think create some. You know, I don't know. I'm not. I don't work for FDA, so I, I don't know what their issues could be. What is Lycos's, um, uh plan or thinking about what would happen were it to get a negative outcome from FDA? So I can uh, field, at least attempt to hear, Ben. Um, so in terms of your first question with ICER, uh, we, ICER has been very uh, public about the fact that we did not directly engage with them. We have been very focused on FDA approval and moving through the federal regulatory process with the agency at this time. Um, and so there were large portions of data that were not shared directly with ICER because we were directly engaging FDA um, as our priority for drug approval. Um, ICER does not hold any jurisdiction over approving a product. They are a nonprofit focused on cost effectiveness. So, Really, it was a um, a longer kind of decision for us in terms of resources, if I'm being quite honest, um, to have to share data and go through the process of a draft report with um, a nonprofit that is focused on price comparison, ultimately, um, versus drug approval through the FDA at this time, and that being our immediate kind of concern and, and call to action at this point. Um, and we have been working very closely, as Ben indicated, um, through breakthrough therapy designation and priority review status with the agency. Um, and the advisory committee meeting that we have tomorrow um, has been anticipated for some time. It takes a lot of effort to prepare for that meeting. Um, it is standard practice for FDA to hold an advisory committee meeting for a first in class treatment option. Um, so that hopefully answers the ICER part of it. Very much appreciate the work that they do. We unfortunately just did not have the resources to be able to kind of help two different organizations with slightly different purviews work through our clinical trial data at this time. Um, second question with rescheduling, um, there's there's a couple what ifs still out there that we can't answer because ultimately this falls um, in the hands of FDA first for drug approval. Um, if the agency does approve the product, the drug enforcement agency is legally bound to reschedule and make that decision within 90 days. So in effect, it is a trigger. There are caveats to everything. So uh, there, there could be scenarios that there's additional discussion within the agencies that are completely out of our control and, and we won't know um, until we're closer to that time and, and those decisions being made. But um, law on the books says DEA, um, is obligated to make a rescheduling determination if FDA approves a product um, that has shown medical 
efficacy uh, that is currently in Schedule One. And I think what you were also getting at uh, was the rescheduling itself. So there's um, potential for this to be a bifurcated rescheduling decision. And again, we don't have control over that. That will ultimately be up to um, the Drug Enforcement Agency to determine what they are willing to reschedule. So in an analogous situation with Epidiolex in 2018, that was a product that had CBD in it. And at the time, hemp and CBD were schedule one with all of cannabis. And the agency only rescheduled that product um, and, and that chemical compound, not the entire class of cannabis. Um, so there's a potential that the agency could look at mitomethetamine itself or look at MDMA as the entire drug class. We don't know. We're, we're not privy to those discussions. Oh, thank you. Sorry, just one quick follow-up question. Um, on the, on your, the second one, my question was more, um, I, I'm, I'm interested in what Lycos's thinking is if FDA does not recommend. Um, oh, uh, we do not get approval. That's what I'm saying. I, it will depend on what they come back to us with in terms of needing potentially additional data or additional studies. Um, and it's- Yeah, I'll say typically FDA does not just say no. Um, when you're at this stage of, of the process, typically what would happen if FDA does not want to approve, they would send you what they call a complete response letter. And that letter would outline exactly what they expect the sponsor to do to address whatever outstanding questions they would have. It would be very detailed. Okay, I understand. Thank you. Thank you. We, we do need to be mindful of time. So Jill, uh, um, I'll let you ask your question and then we'll need to take a break and move on to our working group updates. Yes, thank you. I just was curious, is the practitioners providing the guided therapy the same group of practitioners that are allowed to prescribe? So is, there very, is there a variation? It can be. It, it, it literally depended. Well, all right, so I'll, I'll talk about um, the way we did the research and then, and then what we expect in the real world. So the way we did the research at some sites, it was a psychiatrist who was the site PI uh, and was a trained therapist as well and participated with an additional therapist. Um, in other sites, you had a, per, a prescriber, uh, typically, again, the psychiatrist that would handle all of the medical um, uh, issues. And then the therapy dyad would just be two at least master's level therapists uh, that were licensed. In the real world, I expect it will mostly be master's level therapists doing the therapy just because of reimbursement rates for physicians, uh, et cetera. Uh, I imagine the payers will probably look more for master's level therapists than doctorate level uh, uh, therapists or physicians. Yeah, and, and that will also state to state, again, vary yeah. depending on um, what is deemed oh. clinical psychotherapy licensing and, and credentialing by the state um, in terms of social workers, psychiatric nurse practitioners, it kind of opens the workforce in, in different ways, but we do anticipate in the immediate that it will probably be psychiatrists that will be prescribing as this will be a, a specialty acute treatment. Thank you so much for that. Um, I assume we could uh, continue to reach out to the two of you if we have any additional questions. I know I have some questions around if approved, what does training therapists look like? And will there still be pharmaceutical product available for more clinical trials if states want to go that route? Um, but we can kind of talk offline about that and, and getting your feedback on that. But thank you both so much for attending our meeting and sharing all of this with us. Good luck with the review panel tomorrow with the FDA. And hopefully we have some good news coming in, in August. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you, you very so much. much. Yeah, we're certainly <laughs> here for questions. Yeah. All right. all right, so now I wanna give members a, a time for a break, um, just given the time crunch and we still need to do our working group updates and make some um, 
somewhat decisions around some of the recommendations we're thinking about so we can finalize our work in June. Uh, we'll do a five minute break um, if that's okay with folks. So come back at 12.05 and we'll uh, commence with our working group updates and a little mural activity. So thank you everyone for engaging in your questions and come back here at 12.05 Central Standard Time. Thank you so much. And on behalf of Jessica and Stacy, just uh, letting you all know, we'll be getting about uh, about one minute. Thanks. All right, Jessica, are you ready to go? And Paula on work group updates and discussion, our last big agenda item for this meeting. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so I'll turn it over to Paula to give a brief update on on uh, where we're at with the working groups. And then we're gonna have a mural activity to try to come to a consensus around the four broad options we're thinking of in terms of putting in our recommendations for the report uh, for each of the psychedelic medicines. Um, so Paula, I'll turn it over to you and then we can turn over to mural for that activity. Take it away, Paula. Great, thank you. I uh, appreciate the slide that's up right now. We did uh, change the schedule of the work group to be the second and fourth Tuesday of every month uh, from 4 to 5 p.m. Uh, certainly would continue to welcome uh, more participation. Uh, we are one merged group now, uh, and if there uh, seems to be a need down the road to split into you know more specific work groups, we're certainly open to that. I guess I also want to say I, I want to apologize for um, any role that I've had to or contributed to people feeling unheard or dismissed or that their their viewpoints don't have you know room and I just want to make a commitment to to, to do better going forward. Um, I also would like to extend uh, an invitation if there's anybody from the task force that would like to co-chair the work group with me, especially a representative from a state agency to uh, just give uh, somebody uh, more uh, opportunity to to be involved in leadership and and contribute. So that that's a an invitation that I would, we would greatly welcome. I would greatly welcome. Um, our work, uh, as, as Jessica uh, emphasized at the beginning of the meeting, which I really appreciate the conversation in terms of how we started today, was that we do seem to have a bit of a kind of a an echo chamber or just, a, you know, seven, maybe six, seven folks that seem to be quite active, uh, mostly representatives uh, from the public. We have, uh, you know, some rep representing vets, someone with lived experience, tribal representation, policy, representative of somebody with treatment resistant depression, uh, substance use disorder, expert, and um, um, and medical medical representation. Those, th those seven groups seem to have the biggest representation. And while I really appreciate that, I do feel like we need to continue to to hear from other folks and look for, appreciate the efforts that Jessica has uh, and team have made to try to involve more folks. Um, we are kind of, you know, we keep landing with decrim. I'll just be really honest. Decriminalization of, uh, of, of naturally grown psilocybin is where we have landed um, and spent most of our conversations primarily because uh, it tends to, I think, really um, represent uh, our priorities around access and uh, addressing uh, health disparities, um, staying out of federal crosshairs, and um, uh, just uh, really kind of, again, I think responding to what, what feels like kind of a, 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 a pretty desperate need or, or a lot of energy or, or, or uh, demand or, or request for from the community access to, to medicine. It feels like uh, if we were to look at all three medicines, that, that would be more complicated. So we kind of kind of kind of circle around the idea of a decrim, a decriminalization for uh, organically grown psilocybin. Um, now that gets into all kinds of conversations about facilitators. And I think we, we think that in general facilitation would be a very helpful thing for people to have access to. Who would that be? How would they be licensed? How would they be certified? We think involving licensing boards is, is essential. Lots of uh, conversation about wanting to work with people with lived experience and really embracing community expertise with whatever we do, uh, that, that we really need to make sure that the people that are in the community, that, that are experts are involved in, in whatever happens in, in the event we go this route. Uh, lots of uh, conversations about safety and, and vulnerability, language matters, need for broad education, uh, whether it's uh, you know at all levels, public education, public campaigns. Um, there was some questions about um, 
uh, you know, supply. We have, we didn't, we, we're not in the weeds on that because we don't know if this is where, where we're heading. Lots of conversations about, are we wasting our time going forward with this potential recommendation if the legislators aren't interested in it or the state agencies won't support it? And should we be doing, you know, more political behind the scenes stuff to make sure that we don't just create a report that ends up in the trash. So lots of conversations about how we don't want to really have to just be, you know, guided by by politics and instead really do what we feel is best for the community. Um, so there's lots of conversations around that. Uh, we feel uh, also we have a little bit of time about about the clemency, restorative justice issues, but also not not very clear on that because we don't really know if this is where we're going. Tribal considerations also to look forward to more conversations about that. Donovan has been very active also in our in our work group. Um, we're feeling like we're pretty good with the medical recommendations. Really appreciating the work that uh, Dr. Johnson has provided and all the work that we're spending on, you know, understanding what's happening in terms of the clinical trials. And so we know that we need to kind of get our hands around that. Uh, we're we're starting to talk about needing to get a draft outline together to really inform the report. And um, that's it. And look, please chime in if anyone else wants to say anything that's been attending the work group meetings. Yeah, I appreciate that, Paula. I think um, we do want to open it up for discussion, um, but we do want to orient people over to the mural uh, while we kind of open it up for discussion for the last 20 minutes of the meeting um, to really get people's kind of a barometer on where people are at with, from my point of view, based on all of the evidence um, that we've seen. Um, so we'll be over to the right of the screen. There we go. So this is the mural activity. So we basically have this laid out in a very simple form to get sort of binary. Do you agree or do you disagree? How are you feeling right now on these sort of four implementation options? Uh, so more research trials, state regulated medical program, state regulated non-medical program, and decriminalization. And then we have different rows for each of the drugs. We have the synthetic versions of each of the three psychedelic medicines, as well as the natural version of psychedelic of psilocybin mushrooms. So if you could just grab whether you agree or disagree, either a green um, plus or a red X, and just put those in their respective boxes, and then feel free to come on camera and uh, bring up any discussion points or things you want to talk about based on what Paula shared and what we've been talking about today. And know that these things don't necessarily need to be mutually exclusive, right? Some can exist together at the same time. Stacy, it looks like we're running out of green circles. My goodness, I will make more green circles then. Don't don't take any green circles. Give me a second, everyone. I kept trying to grab some to copy them and they would go. Oh. Just wait, don't grab the green circles. Oh, I've got people duplicates. Look at how smart people are. They know how to duplicate now. Yeah, hang on, hang on. All right, I'll keep making them. You keep using them. Yeah, this is really helpful because we have a lot of work to do in the working groups this month because we really want to be able to key up some real decisions that we'll need to make in July around what kind of regulations do we want to put in place? What kind of policies do we want to put in place? Um, so I think that's where it's going to be really important for us to kind of get a sense of where everyone's at. This is really helpful. Thank you, everyone. And Jessica, this is Stacy. I know that some people aren't at this meeting. I'm just wondering if the group thinks that we should send an email out to those that aren't here that had to duck out early and invite them to the space to make sure they've had a chance to weigh in. What do you think about that? Yeah, I think that makes sense to have them just chime in on the mural and or we could uh, just get a do like an anonymous survey or something if they want to provide that anonymously. Yeah, yep. so uh, Jess and Nick, let's make sure we loop back. I, it probably the easiest thing to do is just to give the members that aren't here a link to the mural and have them go in here as opposed to setting up a, a survey. But um, yeah, I, think I can do that later cool. today. Super. Thanks, Jess. Well, not only this, but also the decision making tools as well. Mm -hmm. I want to just say thank you for creating these simple mural exercises when they're simple, like we move little dots around. I think we do much better <laughs> to try to type in those little sticky notes. So I really appreciate the format. <laughs> yeah, I, I was inspired by Caroline's this, her because I feel like that's always very straightforward and we get a lot more feedback. The sticky notes are great, uh, but then it requires a lot of distillation. 
And it looks like it's slowed down now, Jessica. Yeah, yeah. Looks like we have pretty broad agreement around more research and then it's a mixed bag for the other ones. Mm -hmm. What themes do you see popping up, Paula? Yeah, I, well, it, you're right, you're right. Pretty clear, all green to the, to the uh, medical. Um, more research, but uh, I, I am surprised by the amount of green in the decrim for both um, uh, organic based psilocybin and MDMA um, and and LSD too. There's just, I mean, I'm just surprised by the amount of green in decrim, to be honest. Uh, just, anyway, um, that's what I'm seeing. Yeah. And I feel like I see the most red in the uh, state regulated, so just having like mushroom dispensaries would be right. <laughs> Yeah, well, I think there's, like you said, there's a lot of concerns about uh, both federal crosshairs and cost. Yeah. Yeah. It's just sort of like, so it looks like it's kind of a even split, just in like a high level thing of like a medical program. If we have something like the Office of Medical Cannabis, um, and sort of what does that look like for sourcing if some folks are open to a state regulated program with psilocybin mushrooms and there needs to be some sort of cultivation with that versus leaning on pharmaceutical companies. Hey, Jessica, I have a process question. Yeah. Um, it, does this um, chart here count as a, a sort of a formal vote or is that still to come? This is the temperature taking. Step. Yeah, no, just this is this. Yeah, we're just trying to get a feel because I feel like we're we're hearing the same seven people say we want all of this and not hearing any dissent to that. So I wanted to get an honest barometer of where are we actually at with these different options. Okay, thank you. Because we need to start tracking down what regulations would align with all of this, which is going to be a ton of work, and we only have two months to get all that sorted out. All right, so yeah, we got about five more minutes with this. Is there someone, uh, Paula, are you gonna say something? Oh, I was just gonna say, yeah, and like you, like, I don't know if you emphasize this, but it is curious that there is more resistance to a state regulated non-medical than a, a state re re regulated medical only. Um, yeah, so, mm -hmm. I mean, I feel that makes sense. I think we've been hearing in the echo chamber, oh, this makes sense. People that have done mushrooms, they want to they want to grow mushrooms. It's the easiest way to access it. But Minnesota is fairly conservative, I think, when it comes to drug policy. And I don't know that that just politically is viable. And I think that's kind of maybe what we're seeing is like maybe it might seem like it makes sense in terms of access. Um, but I don't think politically it's viable at this point. I mean, to Bennett's point, we were talking talking about like a phase thing where like, okay, there might be some medical program initially, and then there's a rollout of something like the Office of Cannabis Management came out long before the office or the Office of Medical Cannabis existed long before the Office of Cannabis Management. So it might just take some time to get there, especially if the national conversation changes. But I think we're so early. There's only two states that have legalized this really. And we don't really know what it looks like in practice. So there's a lot of uncertainty, unknowns, and it is one of the options that, even though we could invoke state rights, it crosses a lot of federal crosshairs, I think. It, it's also worth noting here that there um, it seems to be pretty broad support for decriminalization, which is something we've talked about a little bit, um, but have not gone into a lot of depth on. So I think that would be uh, something worth exploring in a future task force meeting or you know definitely in um uh definitely in the the like working group meetings too not to not to not to silence people who have the minority of uh voting opinion on that one but that's that seems to be fertile ground for future conversation i agree I'm curious on the outlier for more research trials. It seems like everyone is on board except for synthetic psilocybin trials. I'm not asking the person that put that there to call it out. I just I just find that interesting. What what that objection would be? If if the person who um, placed that dot wants to share their opinion, I suggest um, 
if you don't want to share it in the open meeting, feel free to email uh, Jessica and and or myself about it afterwards if you want to share your perspective. Yeah, I'd say that goes for all the task force members. If there's anything else you want to share in terms of context for any of this to help us understand where you're thinking and any concerns that you might have, that would be profoundly helpful. The only other observation I would share is that in general, it looks like the most green dots do end up with the, the organic psilocybin. I mean, the kind of across categories. Yeah, I think outside of, you know, relying on a pharmaceutical, an investigational product um, coming through clinical trials. I mean, that's the easiest way to source it, mm -hmm. right? I don't think there's a whole lot of chemists willing to make LSD outside of the underground. Those have come with some life sentences. So I don't imagine that you're gonna see these labs pop up, but cultivators, I think that's a little bit easier. And something the Department of Agriculture could regulate if that was something we wanted to do, but maybe they wouldn't want to touch it if it wasn't federally legal. Who knows? Like, I don't know. I feel like that's one of the agencies we haven't tapped or we don't know. This was something that came up at our last working group meeting around, um, like there's the Minnesota Mycological Society that works with the Department of Agriculture to help with people that are growing, you know, non-psychoactive mushrooms like lion's mane and things like that, that help them kind of grow them, make sure they are what they say they are and that they're not selling people poisonous mushrooms because there's a lot of poisonous mushrooms that actually do kill people. Um, so having regulations around that, but I don't think that was kind of thought about in the initial drafting of the legislation that there might be a grow operation assigned to all of this. I don't know, maybe that's a question for Rep Smith. What are your thoughts about this legislatively? Yeah, I haven't um, considered that. As you were saying that, I was like, I should reach out to the Department of Agriculture and ask about um, how that would slot in. Uh, my, my uh, has already been mentioned, sort of when I look at this, I think it's very interesting and I'm happy that there's a lot of green in the decriminalization, um, but then it's very interesting that coupled with that is a red and state regulated non-medical program because what a bill doing that would do is basically just create this weird gray market uh, where uh, it's sort of illegal and not illegal to have these these substances. And so um, that's been done before with other things, especially in the marijuana field. And that's been sort of mixed results. Um, I think sort of my instinct would be those two things would be better together um, to sort of have a regulated market when we um, you know decriminalize something. But also, we don't want people in jail for just having these substances. So um, sort of processing out loud, because um, these are important things. But I do think uh, it's interesting to me there's so much red in the state regulated non medical uh, programs. Um, just because if we decriminalize, there will be sort of that question of so what now? And if we don't answer that question, it's, you know, every person kind of has that, which is not uh, going to be unique to this. There's a lot of drugs where that happens. But I'm mean, a lot of other things in like business that this happens with, but it does just get complicated. Yeah, I appreciate that insight. Thank you for sharing that, Rep Smith. And, and I think, you know, part of our conversation is also, um, and while it's, you know, new and it's just one city, but we do have some some information that we can draw from about how, you know, a decriminalization type program is is, is rolling out in Minneapolis. Um, as well as Denver, they have two years of data, whereas we have right. not even one. And I think it was July 21st that we, that that was signed in, in Minneapolis. Yeah, and maybe if people aren't, so maybe many people on this are aware, but basically that directive is to say law enforcement do not enforce these particular laws, do not do not you know go through these cases, uh, which is good. But then the question is like, okay, so people who are having psilocybin still, where are they getting it? How do we make sure that's safe? And we don't, we don't know is sort of in even in Minneapolis where they're doing some good stuff, um, and I think Duluth has also directed their law enforcement not to do that. Uh, that doesn't affect where the drug comes from or why, uh, especially if it's grown outside of city limits, et cetera. So um, um, that's, that'd be some good of doing decriminalization statewide as it provides a broader sort of unifying factor for our law enforcement. And I think, you know, try, trying to make sense of what seems to be a, a pretty broadly held perspective here, I think de decriminalization seems simple. Um, it seems like something that the state is within its powers as a, a state to do, um, whereas a state-regulated non-medical program runs into a lot of issues with the federal, uh, you know, Schedule One 
um, status of, for example, LSD or psilocybin, well, I guess MDMA, really all of them. Um, so there, I'm again, I'm, I'm just, I'm trying to make, give some voice to that tension there. It seems like there's a desire to, just speaking broadly, looking at this chart, a desire to put more research into all of these, a desire for some potential pathway for a, a medical, some medical um, application of them, um, some limited but less, you know, desire for a non-medical program, given probably given a lot of the conflict that it would create with federal law, the the problems of cost that currently exist. Um, I mean, my my guess is that is that this is this is reflective of the current federal status of of a lot of these. But then at the same time, saying, well, these sh people shouldn't be getting criminally punished for for use. Um, again, just trying to just trying to read the tea leaves of like twenty five people, <laughs> all, all with different perspectives. But that's that's kind of what what I'm seeing. Yeah, that's helpful. Thanks, Bennett. And I know we're pretty much out of time. Um, so I do want to thank everyone so much for your engagement, your attention. Thank you to the observers for watching. Um, we will be having our next meeting on July 1st. Uh, this will be a meeting where we are going to actually start making some real decisions. We're going to start voting on things. We're going to start figuring out what are these pathways that, that are going to take shape? What are our final recommendations and how are we going to regulate them? And what are the policies we're going to put in place? Um, we do have two working group meetings on the books for this month. Um, that'll be the second and fourth Thursday of the month for folks that want to join. Um, we might have additional ad hoc meetings as needed. Um, if we need additional subject matter experts to come in and give us some more information. Um, but with that, I will just say thank you to everyone. Thank you so much for engaging and participating and providing your authentic feedback. And thank you to our speakers and our guests for attending and the public for watching. And I hope you all have a good week and we'll see you, most of you next month on July. Bye. Bye.